there, folks. Welcome to Sector G, our live broadcasting venue here at PAX Prime. I'm your host, Chris Waters. Let me hear from the audience who's here eating a bunch of bacon and ready to watch a live show. <laughs> that was way loud. I'm impressed. That was way louder than I expected. You guys are great. Uh, joining me on the couch here, we got Justin Haywald and Peter Brown. Hi, guys. We're big hey, fans of bacon. Buddy. Big fans of bacon? Yeah. yeah. I'm I mean, more of a sausage man. You're more of a sausage man? Definitely more of a sausage man. We can tell that by looking at you, Peter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we're going to kick off the show today. Uh, PAX Prime usually not a place where like a whole ton of news comes out, but lo and behold, on Friday, Nintendo, was it a Nintendo Direct? Yeah, they so always do the Nintendo, Nintendo Direct stuff. It wasn't Nintendo Direct. It's not related to PAX at all. This, all, this came out before PAX, really, and this is a Japan-only event where they announced a new 3DS. A new 3DS. And it's literally called New 3DS. No, it's not. It is. It's That's it? <laughs> it is no called. letters after it or No, there anything? are letters. So it, yeah. you can get a standard new 3DS or the okay. new 3DS. Over there, the XL is called the LL. And so you can get the new 3DS LL. And it has some extra buttons. Extra buttons? Yeah, two extra shoulder buttons going to be on this thing. It uh, has an extra analog nub. Oh, okay. Uh, so like, and you say nub, does that mean it's different from the sort of pad? It's like, yeah, it literally is like a little rubber nub that's probably... You're gonna fit in the center of your thumb, and that's about it. You're One just gonna lord over it. One of those things that used to be in like laptops. Yeah, like yeah. on your old laptop. Yeah. And it, it, you know, it's something that's made for the the dual stick game games that need that that dual analog control. And one of them is Xenoblade. Yeah, that uh, the Wii U game from Monolith. Oh yeah. It's yeah. gonna get ported, and it's only gonna work on the new 3DS. And for Japan, they're gonna get that really soon. It's coming out in October. America and the UK. Maybe in 2015? Maybe sometime in the future? Well, I, they're probably going to see how well it does over there. Just okay. you know, see what kind of reception something like that gets. Uh, but it, it does have a faster processor. It's supposed to have better 3D from what we've been told where, you know, when you're holding your 3DS now, you have to like get that perfect angle. And then if you move your head slightly, you just get a massive headache. Uh -huh. This one's supposed to just get that 3D effect no matter how you're holding it. Oh, really? A little I, bit more I, we flexibility. We haven't seen it yet. But. Uh, Xenoblade, that was a huge RPG for yeah. me, and people loved that one. It was definitely beloved in the GameSpot office. Uh, you think it, I mean, that, that seems like a great thing to have on a portable handheld. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, Monster Hunter has thrived on handhelds as well. I, yeah. I prefer those longer experiences. On a handheld, something that you can take with you that you don't have to worry about sitting in front of your TV for hours and hours. Well, and the game is designed for it, too. It has so many side quests. I want to say, like, like a few hundred. And uh, all of those will last you just about a few minutes, right? So you could just imagine playing one of those on the go, you're done, come back later. Close the shell. You're good. Well, yeah. And one of the other reasons that they're going through this redesign is because you have those amiibo figures that are coming out really soon. Yes. And this one's going to have a built in NFC reader. So okay. right now, for the regular 3DS, there's going to be an adapter that you'll be able to get in the US. And if you get one of the amiibos, for, I, I think it only works for Smash Brothers so far, you get the adapter and you'll be able to use it. But in Japan, you'll have a system that you just place it onto and it'll work right away. Have the Amiibos started rolling out yet? When do they release? Because we've been hearing about them for a while. The release date right now is like tentative on Amazon. It's December 31st, 2014. So basically, no one knows yet. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably be not this, this year. year. No, no, I think it's it'll possible. Be this year. Oh, really? Yeah, exactly. we're just not positive when. All right. I, are you guys. So the Amiibos are the little figurines. But they didn't talk too much about Amiibos at the NFC event, but they did talk about a couple other games, right? Well, so we have some games on the show floor, just like any other. <laughs> Uh, in, any of these other shows. We have sure. a lot of E3 stuff, a lot of Gamescom stuff, and if you're on the show floor, everyone is playing Smash Brothers. That is, you know, one of the most exciting games to play. But there's some other things to check out, and, uh -huh. and one of those is uh, Hyrule Warriors. Hyrule Warriors, yeah. They have a bunch of kiosks to play there. Has anybody here played Hyrule Warriors yet? One that guy, guy has. <laughs> All right. Oh, two guys. What about Smash Brothers for the Wii U? You guys tried that out? Yeah. More people. A little yeah. bit more popular. So to be completely honest, I, I hate Warriors games. When I was, I used to be a reviews <laughs> editor, and the Warriors games were the things that we gave people as punishment. Really? To review, you like, were like well, vindictively like, listen, man, your last assignment was late. Like you, you messed up. You know what's going to happen. It's you, in your code of conduct. You, you have to review the next Warriors game. It's Warriors but, time. But I'm actually a little bit more sold on this because it does have that that whole Zelda trapping. And the thing that we got to do in this time, as you can see on the screen, was we got to play around with Ganon. Mm -hmm. And this was a free play mode. It's not necessarily a part of the story like this because you might see Link running around with you in, in some of these other sections. But you'll be able to go back to stages that you already beat, and once you unlock some of these characters, and one of them being Ganon, you can play through the, the game with him. And take on a giant purple plant that barfs plants, and is called Manhandia. I don't... Manhandla? <laughs> Manhandla? Hey, anyways. Uh, so you got a chance to play it. 
Peter? Or? Yeah, well, I've played it in the past. I didn't play it at this show, but um, I mean, look, it really is a Warriors game through and through. It has a lot of the Zelda, you know, like touches, like the music, like these little things that remind you of Zelda. Yeah. So that kind of is like a nice little thing that like draws out a Pavlovian the response. But you know, I mean, you, you kind of have to have uh, an affinity for this sort of game. Um, this but, sort of game being like. I'm a powerful hero pitted against endless hordes of enemies. I can just shred through them pretty easily. Their AI, for the yeah, most part. the That's AI a really is a nice really way of saying button masher. Yeah, <laughs> sure. You know, I uh, like to use more words when less <laughs> will do fine. It's an interesting experiment though, because Nintendo is not usually one to sort of lend out its properties. It's tried it in the past, mm -hmm. but uh, working with Koei is definitely it's unusual. But those games are really, really popular in Japan. Mm -hmm. so. It's something we're probably going to see a, a lot more of these brands going out to maybe be worked on by some other developers. Yeah. Well, we certainly saw it last week with the announcement of Pokken. Mm -hmm. Pokken? Yep. Yep. Pokken tournament, it. which is Tekken plus Pokemon. So, Pokken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. But, but to be clear, there are no Tekken characters. It's not going to play exactly like Tekken, but it's made by the same team, run by the same director, Katsuhira Harada. And uh, it's hitting Japanese arcades first. Oh, it's a really interesting thing. Nintendo rarely dabbles in arcades these days. I think maybe once in a while there's a Mario Kart or an F-Zero game, uh -huh. but it's super rare. So, it's so and that's you, you play as the Pokemon in a fighting game, but yeah. that was no one's gotten their hands on that yet. They just announced it yeah, recently. No, it's only announced, and, and we're assuming it's probably only going to be fighting type Pokemon. You're not necessarily going to be able to be Pikachu. Nope, they said that's not true. Oh, is it not true? Yep. You get to be Pikachu. Good job, like newsman. A, <laughs> like a big muscly Pikachu. Yeah, no, honestly, it's not just the fighting type Pokemon. That's what they showed off. Yeah. Probably just to give people a real sense for you know what the action is going to be like, but they were on record saying that no, we're going to be expanding just beyond those types. I mean, I can't imagine you would launch a Pokemon fighting game and there would be no Pikachu. Yeah, I it think it'll be like four Pikachu standing on top of one another, in like a, in a, like trench, a trench coat. coat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. the Mega Chew. That's what it's called. Totally. <laughs> All right, so this is Hyrule Warriors. Uh, that's playable. Is that is this coming out this year or this is this? Is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, slated for. I, I, I think it's coming. Yeah, coming this fall. People will be able to, to play it very soon. Um, and this was also put together with Team Ninja, as you can see, maybe by the character design. And it's not totally uh, standard Nintendo. Definitely well, you see a little Team Ninja influence there, maybe. A, a, I think a small <laughs> amount of Team Ninja. Influence. It's not that small. Justin. You might, you might be able to tell what part they had a, a had a hand in influencing there. Not the small parts. <laughs> uh, so that, but they're uh, you know, Team Ninja is sort of a combat focus studio. Yeah. Like they, they're, they're fighting, uh, I guess, their, you uh, know, would be their contribution. They're as definitely well. known for fighting and for things like Dead or Alive. Yep. Yes, they are. Yeah. Uh, so Hyrule Warriors is out on the PAX show floor. Folks can play it here. Uh, what else? What's another sort of game they've they got out there? there there's one called Fantasy Life. Fantasy yep. Life. Yeah. It's like right. is a game from Level Five, I believe. Oh, oh really? Correct? Level Five. Being developed by, well, it's being published by Level Five and published Nintendo, by okay. and uh, developed with, by Brownie Brown. They're one of the oh, guys okay. who did the yeah. uh, Layton section, uh, the RPG section of one of the Layton games. Uh -huh. uh, they also helped develop Mother Three. Yeah, they made a, a mana game on Game Boy Advance when that first came out. So they, they have a really good pedigree of making these fun RPGs. And, and when you're playing it, there's a, a game cut that came out recently. I don't think it really resonates with our readers. Disney Magical Life, though. Disney is a Magical lot of fun. Life. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> Who doesn't want to live the Disney Magical Life? Oh. This is like that, <laughs> but uh, with a more standard fantasy type trappings where you can take on different classes and be you know a warrior or a paladin or maybe a cook or a blacksmith. Uh, so this the, in this gameplay footage, the person just changed their life to a blacksmith. Yeah, you're. I mean, you're literally living out a fantasy life. It's that easy. Yeah, just <laughs> like just like in real life, you decide I'm gonna be a paladin today. Guess I'll be paladin. And, and it kind of borrows <laughs> some stuff from Final Fantasy XI, where you can take on these classes and level up in them. And then when you want to change over to something else, you still have some of the abilities from there. It's, but you're not gonna lose all of the progress that you already made. So you can you'll start from level one as a cook, uh -huh. but you still have all the stuff that you did as a paladin. You're not gonna, and then if you choose to be a blacksmith, you're not gonna forget how to make lasagna. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, it, so is it? I mean, is it like uh, Animal Crossing esque at all in terms of the sort of day to day, just doing tasks around town kind of thing, or are there adventures to go on if you're a adventurer? It, I, I guess you could call it like an Animal Crossing RPG because there are there is a combat element. There are things to do outside of just the Animal Crossing being a more of a life experience. There's Cooking this Mama. Is a, this is more of a game. <laughs> there is a Cooking Mama type aspect where if you're the if you're the blacksmith and you're going to make your sword, you do have to do some timing type events to, to get it just right. And if you do it really well, it'll have like a, a little star thing that came up. Like, oh, you made a really good ladle. Delightful. <laughs> and then you decorate your home, Peter. I know you're huge on interior design. Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, so this one, another 3DS game. Uh, was it? Uh, is that slated for release this year? Is that recently announced? No, it's not recently announced. This has actually been out in Japan for the last year. <laughs> I'm really up on my so, Japanese game releases, as you can tell. But it, it's something that I think will resonate. We'll find an audience here in the States. It's coming out in October. I'm personally excited. Like, as someone who put hundreds of hours into Animal Crossing, which I probably shouldn't admit out loud, <laughs> I, I'm very excited to, to play this. But probably not a game for everyone. I mean, you, you can look at it and see, like, oh, it's kind of cartoony. If you're into that kind of collecting and, and maybe playing with friends and, and trading stuff. If you're into fun, fun things, fun. maybe you'll like Do you like it. fun? I, don't know. Yeah. I mean, if there like... is the whole not a game for everyone. That's, I mean, there's no game that's for everyone. Well, when I say that, Except I mean... Except for Tetris. If you don't oh, like yeah. Tetris, yeah. go home and There's and a die. distinct lack of decapitations. There's probably <laughs> very little blood coming out when you slice through people. You're not allowed to slice through people. No, I mean, it doesn't seem like a real slice through people kind of game. What, we see some mining going on? Yeah. Get to explore caves and forests and lots of enemies and and things like that to fight. It's a a weird, it's an interesting mix of genres that I think it'll be a lot of fun. Neat. Uh, All right, so some Nintendo games on display here. New 3DS coming down the pipe. Uh, What do you guys think of sort of Nintendo? What are you looking forward to in the Nintendo-verse over the coming months? Like... Hey, well, you'll, you'll download some Bayonetta 2, or are you looking forward to getting your Smash on? Anything personally exciting for you guys? Well, Smash is, is of course, the dominant game. When you come to something like PAX, even at E3, like just seeing the, the level of excitement, the number of people just gathered around these stations. Three, it's going to come out on 3DS first, which mm-hmm. is not, you know, it's not the best version of the game. Like, we, we're definitely be holding it. We're still waiting for that Wii U version. But 3DS is still a lot of fun. I mean, you know, you get around, you, it's like, you get around to play Mario Kart, you get around to play Smash, yeah. but I feel like, <laughs> you know, the, the screen size challenge, you probably want an LL for that one, or XL. Yeah, yeah, XL is, is going to help a lot, and it's just such a wide array of fighters. I know some of them have been leaked, we're not totally sure how how much we can trust those, uh, those reports that have come out, but mm-hmm. they look really realistic, and one of those that, that came out was the Duck Hunt Dog. The Duck Hunt Dog. And I don't know if this is true or not, but I am, I'm really excited to, to play as the Duck Hunt Dog if this is real, because I heard someone saying, like, he's a dog that you run around and you can throw ducks at people, and I imagine his final smash is going to be, like, having the reticule on screen and being able to shoot at people. And then at the end, he just comes up and goes, Ooh! <laughs> but like, such, such a ridiculous <laughs> thing, like smashes everyone. As around. a kid, like Smash Brothers is a ridiculous game, and like that just cements it. Gloriously ridiculous. <laughs> what about you, Peter? Anything on your radar? You know what, man? I just want more virtual console games. Nintendo yeah. did such a good job on the Wii, and like they're kind of getting better at doing it with the 3DS now. The mm-hmm. Wii U is still flagging. I just want the entire library back. I know there's a lot of licensing issues, um, but yeah, I'm a big fan of Nintendo's legacy stuff and the games that were built for their system. So personally speaking, their big stuff is okay. I'm not the biggest Smash fan, but I think, man, if they spent more time on their virtual console, maybe they wouldn't be in so much trouble financially. I, I'm just saying. You know, what's <laughs> it? Hey, you know, people love that, the old Nintendo stuff, you know, bring it out on, try it out on the virtual console. Well, and right they have there. the second screen experience with the Wii U controller. It's perfect for that. Like, it's a, it's a massive screen you can play these old games on. You what they anywhere. need to do, they need to integrate these systems together so that if you buy a game on the 3DS, it's yeah. going to carry over to the Wii U. You don't have to buy, like, three copies of Mega Man. You know what they might do? And I'm saying this only because it has all the extra buttons and the analog stick. They might phase out the gamepad from the Wii U and make the new XL an optional gamepad. An optional gamepad for the uh, Wii U. Yeah. I like I the way know. you think. It's got a stronger CPU. It's got more buttons. What more do you need? <laughs> <laughs> you just need more buttons. No, but seriously, and it's got like a it's got like a really nice dock that they were aver- they were showing as well. Mm-hmm. Um, if they do that, I'll be really excited about that because I want a Wii U, but I kind of don't like the gamepad in its current iteration. Yep. So it was really funny when they announced it. Peter, I showed Peter as well, and he was like, oh, that looks really cool. And then they showed the dock. He was like, oh, my God, did you see that dock? That is so hot. <laughs> I'm a sucker for docks. What can I say? Hot I love docks. docks from Nintendo for the new 3DS. Uh, Justin Haywald, Peter Brown, thank you guys so much for chatting yeah. a little Nintendo. Uh, I'll release you into the PAX Wilds uh, to play games or eat some board bacon. games or try to get more pins. I know you're a pin chaser. I am. I'm a, that makes it sound dirty and wrong. It is a little dirty, but not wrong. All right, uh, we're going to head over. Uh, Mary and I got to play Borderlands, the pre-sequel, like two days ago, and I got to play as Claptrap, which is really fun because he's like a sassy little robot that like maybe doesn't seem like the coolest guy to play as, but turns out it's kind of cool. So we're going to toss to me from this morning when we recorded this thing. I'm wearing the same shirt, but no, I'll be back live also wearing the same shirt. It's, it's not very confusing. I'm making it way more complicated than it is. Let's hear from me and Mary about Claptrap.
like here at PAX Prime, it's tiny, sassy robots killing a bunch of stuff. Hi, I'm Chris Waters, joined by Mary Kish. Hi, Mary, Chris. good morning. Good morning. Uh, let's talk about Claptrap. Borderlands, the pre-sequel, you and I got to play yep. yesterday. I played as Claptrap, you played as... Nisha, yeah, dual wielding. That's right, you had these like slinger. sweet, ornate guns. Uh, we'll talk about Nisha another time. It's all about the robots, assassin people. Yeah. So you play as Claptrap, and like they've said before, your your point of view is a little lower, but here we see, <laughs> this is what I want to talk about really. He is shorter. He's, he's now turned into a pirate ship on this footage, and That's this right. is vaulthunter.exe, his action skill. And what it does is uh, selects from a random, pa uh, or a package of unlocked abilities. And so this one, Puts these four cannons around the sides of the screen, starts playing the 1812 Overture. That's right. And just starts shooting cannons It's everywhere. a mix of uh, something that's actually really helpful in battle, but incredibly funny and enjoyable because the explosions do go off to the beat. So it's like, -na 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 -na, don't do <laughs> And you get this like awesome, awesome feedback from the cannons that are attached to all corners of your tiny body. It's delightful. And apparently he like also looks like a tiny pirate ship when that happens. <laughs> Obviously you can't see it in the first person view. But that's just one of the different things that, it, it, that his action skill kind of analyzes and chooses based on what's going on. So I think I was facing a, a badass enemy there. We brought out the big guns. But uh, you, you were around for another one. It was a grenade party. Yeah, he's he's such a fantastic, enjoyable character because he's always like kind of like this slurms Mackenzie like oh like let's liven up the party and for some <laughs> reason we're all in this intense battle and it's getting really heated and people are starting to die all around us we need some help and he just says grenades for everyone and, <laughs> and just throws grenades onto the ground I actually needed a bunch we were fighting a boss it was really I, helpful and I just gathered them all up um, and and just started throwing bombs out left and right. Another one that maybe we'll take a look at is uh, turn into a rubber ducky. Uh, <laughs> so like the cannons were intruding on the view before, a giant rubber duck head just pops up and you're always bouncing. Uh, now you as Nisha, like you still get to experience the kind of like floatiness of the pre-sequel because you're on the moon, there's That's less right. gravity, There's people are butt stomping everywhere. Uh, I love the butt stomping. It's a great additional mechanic that I've really enjoyed. When in doubt, butt stomp. Just jump it up really in the air and butt stomp. It takes out a really nice AOE around your yeah, ass. Yeah, it's really nice. And I find it really enjoyable. I had ice on mine, so every time I butt stomped, everyone around me froze. It gave me a lot of time to be able to take them out. Uh, you had a few different types. Yeah, well, I did this, this one right here, you see, is a corrosive damage. And it's it, a fart. Obviously, it's a fart joke because uh, <laughs> it's Borderlands. Uh, so that one's really amusing. And then when you're the rubber ducky, you're always bouncing, so you can <laughs> just butt stomp, butt stomp, butt stomp all the time like crazy. Uh, so playing as Claptrap, it, it's that action skill, the vaulthunter.exe, introduces this kind of randomness, but they're all helpful. I mean, another one is he just throws down a little turret, like Axton in the original Borderlands, and it just starts shooting tons of... Uh, missiles out at any enemy. There you saw a second wind skill that like sends out a tiny little explosive homing claptrap to just blow up whoever's nearby. Very helpful for getting a second wind. Yeah, I noticed that often um, you do end up depleting your life pretty easily. You can get taken out quickly, but you uh, rarely need to restart. You can easily get a second wind as claptrap, kind of like just encouraging you to go for it. And another thing that I really love, claptrap's kind of like this controversial character. Sometimes he's some people love him, some people hate him. I love the fact that as Nisha, when I was playing with you, I was able to give you the old melee high five. That was one of my favorite parts of, of you playing as Claptrap and being able to do this together. So that was a skill at the end of one of the trees. And basically what Claptrap does is he like goes up for the high five. Yeah. And then you decide, you want to melee me back? All right. Then uh, now we both get bonuses to health regeneration and fire rate that's and stuff. That's right, that's right. If I melee you back, we actually get bonuses because we enjoy each other. But if I want to like hey, up top. ignore you, what you screw you guys and then uh, he, I he only I get the bonus and I, and I go off and to hell so with you. it's best to like claptrap <laughs> apparently <laughs> uh, so claptrap new playable class in uh, obviously Borderlands the pre-sequel we've got more on the game coverage coming on gamespot.com so keep a lookout for that here from Pax Prime
And we're back live here at PAX Prime at Sector G, where we are running two hours of live show demos, talks with people who are out and about at PAX, and generally having the whole PAX experience right from the couch into your living room. I'm Chris Waters, and joining me on stage now is Jake Kasdahl from 17-Bit. He's a project lead and art lead on Galaxy. Jake, thanks for coming, man. Thank you. Uh, Galaxy, you guys are on the show floor. People can play the game. Uh, how's the reaction been for, for it's the It's been fans? fantastic. You know, this is our third PAX, but it's the first time the game is like solid. It's running clean. We had a couple of technical snafus, uh, but last night we got the final solid build, so we're good now. Nice. Uh, we're in the Sony booth as well as in the Indie Mega booth. Uh, we've got six playable stations, and it's just going off fantastically. We're getting a lot of great feedback and watching people just really enjoy the game, and we're trying to get the word out that it's not just a traditional shooter. There's a lot more to this game. And so uh, exhibitions like this and getting to talk to the press and stuff is really how we get that message out. That's a great way to do it. And you know, we've seen you guys at PAX before, but this game is further along than ever before. And it's a, a thing of beauty to see in action. So let's jump right in and uh, give folks a taste. And you said, you know, you look at it right away, it looks kind of, you, you, your mind puts it in a certain genre. Sure. But uh, there's a lot more going on here. So set the stage for us. So there was a, uh, you're, it's a spaceship game. It yeah. looks like a spaceship game. Spaceship shooter, arcade games. I grew up playing arcade games, I love them. Uh, the story here is that you, uh, you're kind of this fleet goes out for a big treaty with the evil Imperials. It's a ruse, there's a giant ambush. Everyone gets killed, the entire fleet is wiped out except for your flagship. You were the last, literally the last remaining pilot out. You guys snuck out, they're still looking for you, they're all over the place. Um, you are the last guy remaining, and you're kind of going out and looking through these little planetoids and these derelict wrecks looking for supplies, anything to kind of keep your chances of survival going. So You're on the run. Yeah, she's going to send me in. Every time I start a new game, I'm going to jump in. It's a roguelike, so every time I die, I kind of start from the beginning. Okay. But as you play through, you're going to unlock more and more stuff that's going to start being stocked in the shop. Uh, Stock. Yes, I made that right. You got it. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to start in here. There's a couple things I can buy to start off this game to kind of get me uh, a little bit more competitive. And do these credits carry over from your previous playthrough, or do you sort of uh, have a stock starting credit at the beginning of every run? It, usually you start with no cash, but you find these things called crash coins out in the world, which you can use to buy a couple things at the beginning of every game. Like most roguelikes kind of start you off at, at zero again. Yeah. We let you, if you had a good run, you can buy a couple toys to start your, your game off with. So I'm going to jump into the hangar here and take off. This might give me grief, but I'm okay. Um, so the trick is, like, as soon as you see this, like, again, it looks like a top-down shooter, right? And most top-down shooters are, you know, you're just kind of being drug along by the teeth, and you're just sort of brainlessly shooting all the enemies you can find. Yeah, and this dodging is, the bullet hell that is coming at you. Exactly. This is much more of an open-world E sort of experience. It's all Newtonian physics-driven. So you can see here, I've got complete. That's my favorite my kind shift. of physics. I've got complete control over the ship. Um, the controls are really lyrical. I mean, just flying around, as you get better at it, flying backwards and zipping through things, uh, it feels fantastic. I mean, there's really a lot to it. And you can tell, I mean, I'm sure the sense is heightened when you actually have your hands on the controller, but you can tell by looking at the ship that there's some inertia there, that you know, you're not just turning on a dime and going to wherever the controller, you know, exactly. you have so to incline the analog stick. There's a lot of sort of uh, responsibility for the player, really. I mean, there's a lot to it. This really is sort of a tactical dogfighting game. We've teamed up with a new company called Sentient that's doing middleware for AI. Uh -huh. The AI in this game, I would put up against anything. I put up against Far Cry, I put up against Halo. It really is that level of, of competition. Uh, so, you know, it's more of an adventure game than anything. I mean, it's kind of like a Super Metroid, but like, imagine Halo combat. I mean, I really like to think this is Halo in 2D. Actually, it's closer to Far Cry because you're like, there's enemies that are out on patrols. You don't know where they're going to be. Everything's procedurally generated. So every time I come in here, I don't know who I'm going to come up against or where. You can see these early warning arrows here. There's a bunch of Imperials off to my right and a bug off to my left. All the enemy factions are also at war with each other conveniently. So if you get kind of ganged up on, the best thing to do is run and find some enemies of your enemies and just allow and this kind of chaos to take over. And let them sort of join in the melee. That's these guys don't see me coming. They've got eyes and ears, vision cones. You can tell they know I'm here now. I'd, I'd say so. I'd say that missile barrage uh, sort of kicked them well, off. That's, so that's got kind of, yeah, I woke them up. I, I had a good shot there. A lot of these guys, the uh, these are the Imperials. Their their shields are kind of closer to the traditional Halo style. The pirate shields, they don't actually activate until they are in combat. So if you can manage to sneak up behind them before they know you're there, you can get the head in. Hi, boys. Okay, let me just roll through <laughs> here. So you can see I've got Didn't perfect exactly controls. sneak up on them that time, did yeah. you, Jake? But sometimes you got to go in guns blazing. And so you guys, have a shield as well. Yeah, I've got a shield as well that recharges. My health does not recharge unless I find a rare health pack. But uh, 
you know, in the, in the vein of something like Spelunky or in most of the roguelikes, like, you know, recovering your health is, is not, it's not guaranteed. Like, this is a tough game. You're meant to die a lot. I mean, it really is sort of an arcade simulator. Better to preserve your health than to count on recovering it You somewhere. can see me bouncing off walls here. This is not a game that punishes you for, for bouncing into walls. This is a very physical game. It's all about the tactical combat, and it's very, it's, it's violent. I mean, you're slamming around and slamming through these guys, locking on with some missiles, letting them have it. Dodging their shots. I have this Duke. I can jump out of the gameplay. Yeah, I was gonna say you just like jumped out of the 2D plane there, right? Yeah, no, it's totally cheating, but uh, it is limited and it makes for fantastic dogfighting. So, just hey, if it's the in the game, it's part here. of the strategy. Chasing down the last dude. Uh, so he'll run off and he'll actually call for backup. If his shields are down and there's other guys in charge, they'll they'll kind of try to interject themselves. Let him uh, recharge his shields while he gets uh, his health back. Mm -hmm. um, they'll run off for, for backup. You know, they'll kind of mark my position and call in for reinforcements. I mean, it really is sort of a modern combat simulator dressed as this classic old school shooting game. So we're getting a lot of really fantastic feedback from the show for here. This is a, kind of his nickname, Junkyard Dog. He is a pirate. Is that like a mech with a sword, like an energy yeah, sword? He's, he's actually an enemy. It's an Imperial mech they've, they've taken and hijacked. He's going to fight that bug off for me. And I'm going to get back in his face here. This guy, he's got a melee weapon, so I'm going to just stay away from him. I'm yeah, he's try really to trying to close in on you. Yeah. These exploding barrels and stuff are actually really dangerous. You can set them off, and they'll go oh, flying. Oh, jeez. Bouncing off everything. <laughs> oh, no, that's you right on top of you. Yeah. Ah, oh, that backfired. man. That backfired. I'm out of boost. <laughs> I'm out of warp. My shields are down. Now's the time to just run. I don't want to engage. I want to run. There's my shields are coming back. Okay, now I'm going to go take this guy out. You are still very much on fire. I just yeah, want you to I, know that. I've noticed, yeah. <laughs> I'm also, oh, I've got eight missiles left. All right. His shields are down. I'm going to let him have it while it counts here. Whoa. It's a good fight. These guys, uh, you know, like I said, He's not tough. messing around. This is, yeah. a, this is a tough game. It's, it's a game where you die a lot. And it's not about memorizing anything. It's about being constantly presented with, with new challenges, new, you know, objectives and, and territories, and just sort of learning how to fight. I mean, it really is learning how to be uh, a tactical combatier. Now, how, how much, how sort of out of, oh, I guess you're uh, we doing are a little in, stealth now. Uh, which, are those, I mean, those things are red. They're going to explode, right? Yeah. All see right. See these exploding barrels? Whoa. Speaking the, speaking my language here. I'm trying to find, I would like to, all right, here we go. Okay, so this bug, I'm going to just drag him with me into all these guys. They'll attack him and he'll probably start chomping on them. You see yeah. That? Doing my job for me. I'm going to light this thing up. Oh, I missed. Oh, we're going to get him. Oh, he's in the blast zone. Yeah. I think you put a whammy on one of them with that TNT you can, box. You can hide. I mean, a lot of this is like GTA. I love it. They call it the scramble. You know, when you're running from the cops and you're freaking out, you're just trying to get out. You just need to get around a corner real quick, get you a need little to lose, shield boost. You need to lose sight with them. The problem is they're not cheating at all. They really, their AI is so good. They'll see which trajectory you headed off at, where they think you turned. You know, they'll call for backup and they'll go and inspect your position. See, he thinks he last saw me up there. He's going to go look for me up there. Unfortunately for him, he's by himself now. And I am gonna outgun him. And yeah, you want to so so isolating enemies, uh, sort yeah, of pulling them apart, kiting enemies squad. into other Absolutely. situations. So I mean, it's, it's a lot about positional management and the sort of like battlefield said, it's, management, it's, it's and not just the reflexes. Combat at its yeah. best. I mean, it really is you know this this fight that you're dealt with every time. You're always gonna be outmanned. You're always gonna be outgunned. So you got to think tactically, strategically, using the environment to your advantage, using the enemies to your advantage. Uh, you know, trying to distract them with uh, you know getting into fights with themselves. Try to find how I'm getting down here. So I do have a full map. I think and so is this way. map uh, generated anew each play? Yeah. So these, these are all completely procedurally generated every time. Um, you know, it's going to be a new challenge every time. And those will kind of change organically, too, as you play through the game and you start to play at some of the higher difficulty levels. You know, the, the way that the structures uh, are generated will change a bit. You know, it gets, when you're playing at a high level, it, it becomes a very different game. Like, you literally do not want to engage with everybody. Like, you're just running, trying to stay alive while this absolute, you know, huge gunfights that you're in are going on. Let's see, where am I going here? I think down here. Maybe up here. There we go. And so what are these, uh, are the the items that are sparking, are those just sort of environmental They're environmental hazards, dressing? environmental hazards that will uh, basically take out your uh, shields. Oh, they will they will take out your shields. Yeah, okay. but you can use them by like you know bumping them into enemies, having them uh, lose their shields as well. In one of the previous back. encounters, you were kind of pushing that block towards the, where the, you know, where it was going to go down. Uh, do you guys have any kind of like tow hook or cable to, or, or sort of push beam to sort of lean into that kind of strategy? Something like that, yeah. Um, there's quite a few passive abilities, um, a lot of different weapon power-ups and stuff like that that are, that are coming online. Uh, a lot of that stuff we're not showing just yet. Uh, we're kind of finishing up some of the uh, design of some of that stuff. But uh, there will be a lot more interaction with the environment in general. So I'm almost done now. So these guys, that probe got away. 
and he went and called on my position, so now I've got a problem. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot I'm of... I'm going to get some room between me and these I guys. Mean, the guys look kind of small, but there's a lot of them on the swarm. Yeah. And oh, like they're and cool. missing, oh, and they got a big boy, too. Okay, I'm going to leave now. That's my cue to leave. Unfortunately... Give him a few parting shots on the way out, yeah. and let's bounce. See if I can set up any ambushes here. This is good. If I let this thing go... I just missed. Is that going to cast... Because there was also a tank down there. Maybe that'll cascade. Oh, so you see those those alert things pop in to just like yep. give you the give you the heads Here up. Here comes the party. All right. So again, <laughs> I like to separate these guys from their main crew. Take out the probes and stuff. They don't really have any weapons, but they're really good at, at being really fast, keeping up with you, and kind of calling in your position, and constantly. tracking you, so that. Big Bopper over here can, and this is the Imperial version of the sort of high pirate hijacked these, enemy. These we saw the original ones. The pirates steal these things and, and refit them themselves. Uh, they're you know they kind of tweak the engines and stuff and make them a little crazy, so they're less stable. These things are pretty mean. The Sentinels are one of the meanest enemies in the game. They don't screw around. So here's my warp out beacon. The problem is I need to stay in here for a couple seconds without getting hit, and they're going to make it really hard for me. Yeah, with that missiles. big melee unit around, that's not going to be easy. So I'm going to maybe kick off some of these things and run. How many seconds do you need? Like five? It's, it's like, like five like seconds, yeah. There's no way. These guys all have physics on every single shot they have. They're going to knock me around. This guy with the sword is not screwing around. I'm out of missiles. I'm out of opportunities. You got your work cut out for you I here, do Jake. have the work cut out for me. This is, uh, yeah, I would really wish I had some more missiles right now, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take him out anyway. I got him. You got some, you got, you got, you got some moves. You see how fast he is. I mean, he's... He's breaking contact, like he knows he's being fired on. It's not like he's dumb. I mean, this is like, you know, seriously cutting edge AI. He is like, you know, getting out of the line of fire and making sure that he's got, got time to and recharge his, his shield before he re engages. Yeah. And yeah. then coming he's back at you. Troublingly really start. What I can do though is I can pump this thing Oh, yeah. Him, take his shield nice. out. So are you. Yeah, you're trying to take out, out that way. big Oh, melee man, unit he's going to get me. This is bad. Could you make a run for the exit? I mean, they're around the corner. Maybe I can get up here and warm out in time. Get. Ah, I missed Oh, no. It. Ah. Overshot it. Curse you, Newtonian go, 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 physics! Go, 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 No, that's not gonna happen. Nope. <laughs> so close. Jeez, this is crazy. All right, I'm gonna just take this guy out. He's killing me. You gotta get one of them down. And I didn't, uh, I stupidly didn't buy any weapon power-ups uh, at the beginning of the game, so I'm basically operating on my super base level laser here, trying to take what out... What power-ups did you buy at the beginning of the game? I think I bought a missile expansion and a speed expansion. Well, the speed has helped you out a little bit. He's not gonna let me out, man. Oh, I believe in you. You can do it, Jake. I'm wondering if, uh, you know, there's been a lot of changes lately. I'm wondering if the shields <laughs> aren't a little overcooked on this guy because I feel like I've earned a death by now. There's one. There, okay. you got one down. You got now plus eight missiles for that kill. Oh, really? Or did you find? Yeah, I just saw it pop oh, up. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, you oh, have some nice. of this, friend. I got something for you. There you go. <laughs> and once your shield's down, I'm gonna get in as close as I can. Land him there. Got there him. it okay. is. All right, nicely Jeez, done. Jeez, man. Okay, here we go. Now let's get out of here. So you can see, you know, defending these things are generally the, the toughest guys in this stage are going to be defending your warp out zone. Mm -hmm. So securing the landing zone is, uh, is a bitch. And these guys are really smart, they're hard, and uh, it's a challenge, and I just lost my video. Oh, no, here. demo's over. We're, we're shutting okay, it down. Okay, good. That worked out just <laughs> no, we're in good. time. That was a perfect way to end it. You succeeded. <laughs> you got out. That was awesome. good. My heart's pounding a little bit. You know, uh, it's good to demo while you're uh, running for your life. So. Absolutely. That took a, l a little more than 10 minutes. Is that about the average sort of length? Yeah, for, there's about, for uh, the so there's, there's about four or five. We're still working on this, but there's going to be four, five, or six of those in a row to beat the season. Okay. And when you beat the season, you sort of beat the game, and that opens up the next season, which is going to have some new story stuff. It's going to have some new unlocks. And there's six seasons overall. There's a mini story arc over each one, and there's a massive story arc over the entire process. All right, so. Jake. Well, when are you guys targeting for uh, Galaxy's release, and what systems are you aiming to bring it out on? So uh, we're working with Sony, the Pub Fun Group. We'll be launching uh, this holiday, kind of post-holiday, probably wintertime, okay. uh, on PS4 and Vita, and then shortly thereafter on PC. Very cool. Jake, thank you so much for showing off Galaxy. Thank you. Uh, folks, that's coming this way, coming your way this winter on PlayStation platforms. Now we're going to take a look at a surprising announcement from developer Harmonix. It's a game called The City Sleeps, and it's not really what you might expect from the uh, rhythm game titan that they are. Let's check it out. Hey everyone, welcome to PAX Prime, I'm Peter Brown, I'm here joined by my friend and my boss, 
Randolph Ramsey. Let's 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 not get too formal with each other. Okay. Yeah. How are you? I'm great, man. And I know that you got a chance to go see a game called A City Sleeps. That's right. It's the new one from Harmonix, and it's kind of a, I guess, a, a weird direction. They sort of like popped up with this game at the start of PAX, and it's something that you normally wouldn't expect for them. So it's a shmup. Yeah. Which, as you know, people will know, it's shoot 'em up. <laughs> uh, a bit of a bullet hell shooter. I think we're seeing some footage of it now. Uh, and um, you know, a couple of the guys that worked on Chroma. Yeah. Uh, which was that shooter that you know the harmonic guys were developing uh, and talked about at the start of this year. It was going to be like a, a rhythm-based first-person shooter. Uh, so you know, while they were, they were working on that and trying to retool and trying to find out what they want to do with that game, yeah. uh, you know, they had a few folks you know do a side project um, and you know taking a lot of the stuff that they learned from you know, um, you know trying to do a shooter within something like Chroma into uh, a, a bullet hell shooter like this. And you know, like the two lead guys in this are apparently are sort of massive fans uh, of the genre. And as you can see right now, it's um, a lot of bullets on so, the screen. Yeah, I mean, we talk about harmonics and you, you brought it up with Chroma, but yeah. I need to know what's going on here because they're known for their games that incorporate music and rhythm. Yeah. Is that a part of the gameplay itself or is music just sort of emphasized throughout so, so, the game? So, so music is heavily emphasized because you're right, it is harmonics, a harmonics title, so you know they're always going to be about the music. Um, it's not similar to anything else I've done in that you're not actually beat matching, so you're not, you know, you're not shooting to create a beat or anything like that so there is like you know a strong sort of like hip-hop ish soundtrack that goes throughout it the uh, the level itself is sort of mapped to you know matching uh, like the beats and rhythm of the of the music itself but you know it's not actually like a, like a specific sort of like note matching thing like you would have had in a rock band or you know any other thing that they've done in a recent past uh, the shoot-em-up genre has a really strong following in Japan. It, it's not as big in North America. No, it's not. Uh, we had a game come out about two years ago called Cinemora that was made by a Hungarian studio with Grasshopper Manufacturer from Japan. Yeah. And that was a really nice mix on the, the sort of shmup uh, you know, genre. But uh, you know, one thing I'm wondering is, does this game have hardcore appeal? Because Harmonix doesn't typically make games for people that are fans of shmups. It, it, it's interesting you say that actually, because you know, like the two lead guys for this are apparently are sort of huge uh, shmup sure. fans. So you know, they did not want to actually dumb it down for more of a Western audience. So you know, they are you know trying to make sure that this has the same type of appeal uh, as you know, like a, a really hardcore Japanese shmup. So what we're seeing on the screen here, I believe, is actually just on easy difficulty. Okay. So, um, you know, it, it, it will be, you know, uh, it can get a lot more challenging. So, you know, in higher difficulties, you know, like the, the boss, the you know, bullet patterns will be different. Uh, and that's typical for a shmup. You see that little, um, the blue dot in the middle of your character Poe? Yeah. There? That's actually your hitbox. Okay. Uh, so, you know, you just have to be uh, really accurate, you know, with how you actually maneuver. And and the thing that's uh, bl glowing green right now, those are, I think, you know, two of the, I guess, the un more unique things that, you know, Harmonix is trying to, to put into this game. So, Poe, uh, she's a dream exorcist and your main character in the game. Of course. Has access to these three um, sort of like ghost powers. Uh, that she can deploy at any time. So, you know, one uh, will give her health. So um, it's disappeared right now, but the screen before, like that green thing that was uh, that was sort of like pulsing, uh, would give out pulses of like green that you can catch to, um, to boost your health. Uh, and another one is like for attack, and another one is like boost your defense. So um, you can sort of switch that out on the fly, and you can see the sort of the menu just popping up around her. Um, mm -hmm. You can like choose which ones that you can actually, um, you want to do um, to, to deploy. So we're seeing a boss battle now, and I gotta say, Peter, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge shmup guy, so you know, I'm, you're much more familiar with, with the genre. Like, from what you're seeing here, like, you know, does it is it really evocative of you know lots of Japanese titles? Uh, at least in terms of the the Don Maku, like you know the uh, mm. the the curtain of bullets, as yeah. it's sort of referred to. Like, yeah, you definitely have those elements, and for an easy mode, mm. it's pretty interesting. I'm curious to see how the hitbox is going to change. Yeah, I'm assuming if it, the game is on a higher difficulty setting, that hitbox is going to be a little bit larger. Yeah, um, but as it is, yeah, I mean, it does seem to have. You know the, the elements that you'd look for. It it is a little bit unusual in that you can move anywhere on the screen and fire mm -hmm. in any direction, but uh, but that's sort of an interesting element. Uh, yeah. and it's that, it's curious to see what Harmonix can do with this because mm. they're fans of the genre, but it's their first time doing it. Exactly. But I think they might bring something really interesting. And what's really interesting too is you know the development of this has been uh, quite unique, I guess, for the studio. So you know they're trying to do uh, a little bit of a double fine type thing in which they've all broken up into smaller teams trying to iterate really quickly, trying to come up with game yeah. concepts and just seeing what actually sort of flies and sticks and what's got appeal. And this is the first one really that, you know, so sort of utilizing that new model. Okay. And it's coming out to 
um, PC and Mac via Steam. Uh, have any dates in mind? Uh, no, um, I think they've got a date for October. I don't have the exact date, but we can sort of update that with later. All right, well, that's City Sleeps by Harmonix coming to PC and Mac pretty soon. Stay tuned to GameSpot.com. We have a whole lot more PAX coverage on the way. So obviously PAX Prime is a lot about games, not just video games, tabletop games, card games, eh, all the kind of games your little brain can think up, but it's also about the people who are here, the events, the panels, uh, just the whole creative strata that comes down the line when people come together to celebrate the stuff they love. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce my two guests to my right here, Mikey Newman and Chris Straub. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. No problem. A pleasure. I, I almost did not make it here on time. You are... You are here with plenty of time to spare, but you were running from the Gearbox panel. Yeah, we had the main theater panel down on, it's like second in university, so. So what is, what is a, a Gearbox panel? So you're a writer for Gearbox. Yeah. Or, and, and more. Yo, I, technically my, my title is Chief Creative Champion. Chief Sir, Creative Champion. Which means not a lot. No, that's, it's, a, that's a great Do you title. shorten it at all? Do you say like a tri C? It's come up. Do you try it's to come like up. make it's, it yeah, a little cleaner? Uh, Do you go three C or C cubed? C Wait, where, where are you at? Where do you want to? Okay. C cubed. So yeah, we did uh, we did the Gearbox panel. That was super fun. Uh, Randy Pitchford did the Ice Bucket Challenge on stage. Oh wow. Which, you know, maybe could be, be worn out its welcome a little bit. Though it's great cause and they're making a lot of money doing it. Uh, he actually laid down on his back in a kiddie pool. Oh wow. Uh, so full. Like, and they not. they dumped it super slow <laughs> from his feet all the way up. Um, and he, I've never seen him freak out so physically before. He was like, it was, it was actually kind of terrifying. We're like, are you okay? Is it, do you need, do you need a blanket? Do we need a towel? We just covered him in towels. Yeah, they have to have medics on staff for that type of thing. We did not. That was actually probably the one thing we did that not. That is incredibly <laughs> irresponsible. Randy Pitchford, come on, man. But for a good cause. It Honestly. was a great cause. Great cause. Uh, so you've been doing, so you were doing some, uh, some Gearbox stuff here, but you also delivered the PAX keynote. Right. And talk to me, like. Keynotes differ widely from packs to packs. The sort of the format changes, the speakers change. Uh, what what was your situation like? What you what you deliver? Well, I because uh, Robert Koo was the one that asked me originally, and he sent me an email, and he's like, "Hey, do you want to keynote a packs?" Mm -hmm. And I said, "Of course, right? I yes, mean, that's yes, awesome." Please. Yeah, uh, and I hadn't really thought of what I was going to say at that time. Um, and uh, he's like, "Well, which one do you want to do?" And I thought it was going to be Pack South because I'm from Texas anyway. Uh, nope. nope. I was just like, well, Pax Brown is my favorite, and he said, lock it in. Nice. So, yeah, for like six months, I guess, I've been thinking about it. And I, it, I'm i sure we've all noticed that over the last month, two months, it's, it's gotten to a, a riled up situation out there in our industry. That's and very I true. Wanted to, I wanted to go on stage and, and kind of try to start bringing this back together. Uh, a call for sanity, and uh, the, the main point was just about spreading joy, so... I, I like hope both it, of those things. It went well. Sanity, joy, those are like on my top list of they things. They do go to together. Like. The Venn diagram, they oh, do yeah. overlap. Yeah. So the gaming sort of connection for you, Mikey, uh, is through Gearbox, is through Borderlands. Actually, before, we, I'm, I'm going to talk to you in a second, Chris, but we have to roll this interview that I dug up the first time you and I met. I was telling him about this. <laughs> we oh, my gosh. met in 2009 oh, when no. Borderlands was uh, just first announced at E3. Uh, we're going to get our, our interview up here and take a look at us from kind about of five years ago. This I don't is know. Like, Probably the same. Maybe my second E3 interviewing, and <laughs> yeah, there it is. Oh, Time man. Capsule. That's like Matt Damon. This was a really fun interview. <laughs> look at those glasses. What do I think? I'm from <laughs> space? What am I doing? <laughs> oh, man. It's uh, like Google Glass without any of the electronics in it. It's just a fashion, uh, yeah. he's fashion forward, you know? Yeah, it's Google ass glasses, that's what I have on. I think my favorite thing to come out of that was a user comment that said, we looked like school days friends. I, uh, <laughs> which I, I guess is cool. That's uh, actually really <laughs> funny, considering part of my keynote was actually just about this story from fifth grade. Oh, really? So I, I feel like we brought it up. I can't believe you dug that up. That's so <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah, oh, man. my God. You were in yeah, fifth grade like, there? That was amazing. Yeah. No, I was like, Borderlands, really excited. Recess, come play it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I got my crackers, good. got my juice. I'm ready to go. 
Uh, so you guys collaborate also outside of the Gearbox software realm, and that's uh, on your website, or I mean, I guess you guys sort of, it's, my, it's, it's my, your website. My best brand. My best bud. Com. Yes. Yeah, I'm a cartoonist. Uh, I work out of the Penny Arcade offices. I've known them for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I did the uh, intro animations for Acquisitions Incorporated, that stuff, every year. Which was a huge hit last night, I, yeah, as I a, heard. Yeah, a pleasure. I couldn't attend. It's, it's horrifying. We had a panel. We had a panel like we had our right show. opposite. And Acquisitions Incorporated, for those who don't know. It's the uh, Dungeons & Dragons Live, the celebrity game. Yeah, Very every cool. year. Uh, so, But you're a cartoonist. People can check out. I mean, I'm sure people have seen this. Maybe, you know. they Big ups to Frank web, and Oak right, right now. Frank and Oak are getting a little extra <laughs> Let's play. get that manly <laughs> style <laughs> under $50. Can we, can we shop, shop now? now, actually? Can we take Yeah, can we just go through? <laughs> this, uh, Give me some of that. <laughs> they will do it. Don't, don't tempt them. I uh, saw so. it hover. <laughs> uh, so this thing's been going for a little while now. Yeah, you've been in yeah, how long? I've been a uh, chainsaw suit I've done since like 2008, but I've been a cartoonist since 2000 mm -hmm. professionally. Professionally. As a pro. In as much as anybody is a professional. Do you go to Comic-Con ever? Yeah, I went to San Diego Comic-Con for uh, 10 years. I have wow. stopped going. Oh, and yeah. my first year was this year. <laughs> yeah. And it was just, I had the sad Charlie Brown Ships clone. the night. The cloud following me. You're like, oh my God. You're like, hi, right, Chris, I'm hanging out on boats. I wish you were here. A lot of boat action some, this year. Some boats here at San Diego. One of them's real big. They put planes on it. Yeah. One of the larger boats I've seen. Yeah, yeah. actually, San Diego is a boat. Uh, I did not. That's amazing. Yeah. Hashtag, tweet us that hashtag, San Diego is a boat. <laughs> Your chance to win. <laughs> A yeah. Dinner with Chris Waters. Oh. It's, <laughs> it's a hashtag. It's sure. got to be true. It's, it's true. That, that is what brings all things into being these days. Yeah. Uh, but Chainsaw Suit, you guys have, you've got the comic there, but you guys also do a podcast. We do. A, we have a podcast and a YouTube channel. The podcast is chainsawsuit.com slash podcast. We've done, as of last night, 70 episodes, though it's not up yet. Uh, how would you describe the show, Chris? Let's talk. It's comedy. And uh, it's it's well sponsored as well. Yeah. Oh we, yeah. We, we are our own sponsors. The sponsors we do a are lot one of, of my favorite things about yeah. this show. We throw to fake commercials constantly. Yeah. Uh, what were the ones we did? Because we had some for the panel that we made literally in an hour. No, I did one for Purell Retribution. It's no longer about hand sanitization. No. It's about making the germs themselves sick. Oh really? Because we've lost the battle. Yeah. It's over for All us. All we can do now is strike at them from our decline. It's just attrition at okay. this point. Yeah, and then and then mine was it was for the Long John Silver's fish plank enchilada. The Long John Silver's fish plank enchilada, which as we go, because there's like we can make fun of our product, but we actually just did this thing about how the guy I ate it too much and he was communicating through a Ouija board with a fish plank enchilada on it to his daughter, because that's what you can expect from Chainsaw Soup. <laughs> yeah. We also have a YouTube channel, slash Chainsaw Suit Original. What do you do on the YouTube? Uh, well, we animate some of the commercials. Uh, right. You you're have doing, a show. You're doing a series called Movies with Mikey. Yes. Which is you should check that out. well received. Which, it's pretty straightforward. There's movies. There's Mikey. I, this, if, I, if I may, may is I Is that reductive? This? I don't want to. Wait, Chris, please feel this. Uh, it actually goes in line with your keynote. When you talk about positivity and joy, there's a lot of review stuff on YouTube that's just like, taking movies apart and finding all the negative stuff. Yeah. You love these movies and you're yeah. reviewing them and giving a lot of information about and, why. And part of it's like finding hidden gems. Uh, a good one to start with would be the Last Action Hero review, if you can find that. Which because you would think. Well, yeah. I even I didn't remember it being as, as baller as it was, but the in the Last Action Hero review, just to give you a, a preview of what I do here, uh, I talk about Schindler's List and the symbolism in that movie, and then I talk about the symbolism in Last Action Hero. Oh, wow. And what starts as a joke, you realize, no, it's actually deeper and more There's effective in Last there. Action Hero than it is in Schindler's List. Because Schindler's List, great movie, very surface level. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, she's got a red sweater. I don't know sure. if I would have led with that example. It sounds like a <laughs> Sounds bad now. Yeah, yeah, well. Retrospect, but you know, you get, you get deep on cinematic theory. Who knows where it's going to take you? Yeah. Ha hashtag 9-11 was a boating accident. Which is also one of the bits. Which is also one of the bits, yeah. Yeah, that uh, one will not get you dinner with Chris Waters, yeah. uh, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> good, so, oh, there's, there's Michelle. Oh, look there at it. it. Last action hero. I was actually pleased to hear you extolling the virtues of a long kiss goodnight as well. Yes. Oh, yeah. oh my God. Well, these are two, because uh, uh, we have Shane Black wrote this film, and Shane Black also wrote The Long Kiss Goodnight, which I love. I think it's Samuel Jackson's greatest film. Uh, Rollerball is not Samuel no, Jackson's film, <laughs> nor is he in it. 
He was like uh, a key grip, I think. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 a show where I get to celebrate movies. My my next review is actually Waterworld, and that was a requested one. Oh yeah. Because some of it's like, can you accept the challenge of the film? And Waterworld, I realized something really crazy. Just to break you off a little preview, <laughs> all of their costumes are like if you look at Dennis Hopper in the movie. He plays this very surface level villain, but he has glasses turned sideways to make the eye patch for his missing eye. It's implied that those are his glasses because he has trouble seeing things, uh-huh. like from a distance. And okay. I was like, so when you actually look at all these characters, like the guy with the six pack plastic rings for Cokes and stuff made in vet, there's all these like stories in their costumes. Yeah. I'm going to reconstruct this entire other narrative of the movie that actually exists under the not so awesome movie on top. Uh, the upshot of all this, and you've also like written a few novels, is that you guys combined well, he, are like this incredible creative force, like not just in your professional lives, but also your personal lives. Obviously, your great friends, and romantic like, lives, yeah, your romantic lives, incredible. your you know psychosexual lives, the whole, all levels, all the all the Jungian fragments. Well, I mean, you 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 have Brood Hollow as well, which I would I would be remiss if we didn't talk about a little oh, bit. Oh yeah, that's right. It's a, that's, Brood Hollow. That's my most recent web comic effort. I did a Kickstarter for the first book last year. It did very well. Nice. Uh, it's uh, my, the shorthand pitch is Tintin goes to Innsmouth. Goes it's to Lovecraftian, in- but like a 1930s. Oh, okay, that's comic. where Innsmouth. Eh, it's coming. Yeah, back. I, I've also done awesome. with Tintin goes to Twin Peaks. There's if you a need Twin something Peaks a little, line. just a, a little maybe. If you're a younger person, you know what Ismus is. They have to know what it is. Well, okay. Sorry, if you don't <laughs> you know, know what Cthulhu is, that's, that's right in there. Oh, I wouldn't show the new comics, though. Well, if they pull it up, yeah, it's kind of spoilery. Nah, it's okay. Uh, no, it's uh, fine. Uh, don't worry. All right. About it. uh, yeah. uh, it's okay. Now so they're faking us out with the other comics. <laughs> You've lost control of this interview, Waters. Come on. Did man. I ever have it, Mike? No. How are you doing? No, is and the I'm question. okay with that. Are you good? Me? Actually, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm excited to get out to the Indie Mega Booth today. Uh, Ooh, yeah. Play some games there, hopefully. I've been doing doing show stuff. Hosted a Civilization panel yesterday. I am so... Oh, do you wow, have you played wow. it yet? Oh, yeah. Dang it. Yeah. I'm jealous. Civ Five is my favorite game of all time. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Beyond I Earth cannot look, wait. It's looking pretty cool. Uh, but I want to bring it back real quick to, to like try to hold on to the last vestiges of control I have over the situation before it just all spins out. And well, we're going to welcome the, the next stage. guest to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> They'll have to both sit there, though, I think. Because <laughs> I'm staying right here. Yeah, it's no, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> it's the whole, like, the, the staggering amount of sort of creative, like, art and expression that you guys both uh, sort of output is inspiring to me. Because, you know, I get, to, I get to do some fun stuff here at GameSpot, but, like, you know, I thought about like maybe like writing a little book one time, or maybe like uh, doing a YouTube series. But you know, I feel like a lot of people there's not that uh, that initiative, that hustle, that that drive to sort of start creating the thing that they are daydreaming about. Or <laughs> yeah. do you guys? It's you have you to you do it because you love it, and then it doesn't matter whether or not it succeeds or fails. I th- if, if if even if it failed, you're still doing it because you love. Still it. doing it. Just, yeah. Just a. Attacking like in a collaborative way. Sure, yeah. Because I've done a lot of side projects with with a few different people, and I remember when we originally because we both lived in Dallas for a long time, and now you live in, in you went to L.A. and then Seattle. But I didn't know I didn't know him in Dallas at the time. We at did all. not know each yeah. other at all. Um, and you were coming because we were doing a, a show at PAX that was like two and a half years ago or whatever. Right. Um, you were coming to pick me up, and I was I was worried because I was I'd, I'd heard Chris was an a hole, like I've been told that, and I was like, oh, here we go. We got out of the car, like, down the street to get sushi. I mean, we, it was, like, a two-minute drive. And we're like, hey, you want to be best friends? Because it was, like, yeah. it was crazy collaborative. Yeah. yeah. And that person was wrong about me. No, they weren't. I actually, well, I actually am an a-hole. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're just really good at faking it. Sorry, sorry, Dad. It just turns sorry. out sorry, he's, sorry, sorry, he's Dad. just your kind of a-hole. I mean, you know, everyone's yeah. an a-hole. No, I mean, I, I think we, we consistently set a bar for each other, especially when it comes to comedy and even... Even like the positivity in comedy, because that's always been our our, our slant is like, because people are like, oh, don't don't punch down, punch up, and we're like, what if we didn't punch anyone? What, what if, if we, we? But what if we also punched laterally? What if we also punched ourselves? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's self. We I mean, we punched some brand like TGI Fridays and Guy Fieri. You know, like, we don't feel as bad you about that. You guys were taking digs at Long John Silver's earlier. I mean, that was some. They, no, the fish plank. That's like a diagonal. The down fish plank punch. gelato. They take the the we, fish plank, American cheese. Hush puppy batter and they deep fry it. It's the it's the fish pie. It's is that, off is menu. That real? No, it's not real. Okay. It, I wish it was. I don't. We fish because we love. I don't know about fish places. 
<laughs> it's not my area of expertise. That's okay. There's time to learn I've, and grow. I've been calling Long John Silver's a so fish full. place. It's maybe a little strong. <laughs> There's fish in that chain somewhere. The supply chain. You gotta so, go back far enough. It's yeah, all right. It's, it's in, it, it evokes fish, at least. Right. Maybe it's fish. Fish-esque. fish nine. Fish places. style. <laughs> so having a creative sort of, someone to bounce stuff off of, someone to collaborate with, is that a, is that a sort of a way that's been, it's been, obviously it's been gratifying for you guys. Do you think that that's, a sort of a powerful way to kind of give yourself a little bit more energy. Do you get get energy from each other, like dedicate, like to claim that time during your day? I'm gonna take this one. Yeah. I I am a very funny person, but I'm also the lowest possible energy person. And I'm kind of the highest. Highest. I used this really silly metaphor to describe <laughs> us yesterday. I'm gonna say it. Yeah. It's cheesy, but accurate, but cheesy. Uh, if you have two knives and you're trying to use them separately, eventually they'll dull. But if you take both knives and constantly sharpen them off of each other, they're better and knives. The, and, but the knives grow to hate each other. <laughs> they cannot stand each other. There's just a lot of, yeah, a lot of tension <laughs> Vin- that develops between the knives. A vindictive knife sounds like not a great thing One to of those knives around. moves out of the state even though, you know, you hadn't met it that yeah, point. Yeah, it's, it's gotta, a bummer. you got to sort of track it back. No, I'm a big fan <laughs> of collaborative humor. And I think that I, to go out by myself somewhere, I don't know if it would play as well. Like, I need somebody to play off of. Well, even at the table, because this is, uh, we have the Chris Travel, Mike and Newman Chainsaw Suit table out in uh, Bandland. If you're yeah. here, come see us. Yep. Come get a limited edition Chainsaw Suit print. But it's so, it's Salesman, like. Salesman, that's amazing. Of course. <laughs> but I'm saying, like, when you, if you're alone at a con at a table, it's nowhere near as, as fun as just sitting around with your best friend and signing stuff. And it's like, wow, this is amazing. So Enjoy yourself, yeah. And you I'm really you so can be a third bestie. Can, oh, listen, listen, it's a love seat for two, you know, and uh, hey. I'm happy to just be near. You know, it's just, the, it's just the right width. All right, we, we're coming to the end of this conversation situation. Yeah. Let's do the, let's do the rundown. What do, you want, what do you want some viewers to, to see, to do, to, uh, to check out? Well, come out. If you're here, come out, see us in Bandland. Otherwise, you can find us at uh, chainsawsuit.com. Mm-hmm. Subscribe to our podcast. Yeah, uh, Chainsaw Suit Original on YouTube. Uh, uh, we're both very handsome. You yeah. can look at us visually. Uh, Borderlands, good. the pre-sequel, coming out this October. Please check that out. Yeah. Uh, it's awesome. It's actually really awesome. It's pretty fun. I got I, to play as Claptrap, as the viewers saw earlier. I'm, I'm fairly certain I can say it's my favorite Borderlands experience now. Favorite? It's, added, a nu- it's, it's, it's added so much to it. It's, it's rounded it out. I really enjoy the butt it. butt stomp. Is what you're, is what you're gesturing like, Really, I'm just there. saying you can butt stomp and shoot acid at... at can, I, can I give it a shot today? I haven't played it yet. I haven't tried it yet. Yeah. Oh, all right. Take, no, him, I, yes. take him off to play Borderlands. There Mikey Newman, Chris Straub, thank you guys so much for chatting. Talking packs. Hopefully we'll run into you guys packs. later sometime. I'll go get a chainsaw suit print. Uh, Bandlands. Please do. All right, folks. Uh, we are going to go, I think, just like right over here, maybe. Talk to Danny O'Dwyer and Drew Scanlon. Is that right? Or are you just misleading me grossly? It's going to happen. Let's go check in with those guys. We'll be back up here with some more game demos. I think Shadow of Mordor is coming up soon. Stay with us. Hey, what's up, everyone? Danny O'Dwyer here and Drew Scanlon, the, uh, the duo of Alt F1. Uh, d- delighted to be here at Sector G, the home of uh, GameSpot, Giant Bomb, and, of course, uh, everyone's favorite Formula One podcast, Alt F1. That's right. How are you enjoying back so far, Drew? That's good. You're leaving soon. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got a four o'clock flight. You're gonna grab a. You're gonna grab some food from these yeah, these I'm wonderful. This bistro back. of free food and delicacies right here on 720 Pine Street. It's here. Just follow the signs. It says Sector G outside. Eat all this free food. Sector G Yelp for Sector G. Yeah, there you go. There you go. PAX is not just about free food, though, Drew, or Formula One race cars. It's also about video games. That's right. Did you play any today? I did. Thank you for serving that up. I played a video game called N++. Tell me about it. I'll tell you about what? N++. N++ it's a is a video game. Did you play any of the old N games? I did. I actually took a class uh, in college where we made N++ levels for a uh, project. Really? Yeah, mine was awesome. Wow. That's one of those hippie colleges, right? Yeah, UCLA, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the first one, Old Flash Game, came out in 2006. Uh, 2008 was the Xbox Live Arcade game, N+. Plus. Yeah. It was brilliant. I loved it. Real hard single player. I did co-op with one of my friends. We played the whole game through. Uh, I had something like 100 and some 50 levels, maybe. N++ plus plus has 1,000 levels. That's a lot. Of, I didn't know that. 1,000. That's a lot. I know. It's not just one dude. Well, there was like two. A guy and a girl made it before, and now they got a bunch more people making it. It's coming out. 
next year early apparently um, all those levels they're doing a competition today actually if you're at PAX at 3pm they're doing a competition to win a PlayStation 4 that's fun that is fun it's coming out on PS4 first I hope it comes out on PC and stuff afterwards do you do I or will you play it on your PS4 I don't have a PS4 you could go back to UCLA they probably have some you can make more levels you guys got any PS4s yeah they're making that whole level sharing system as well so okay. apparently that's why it's taking a little bit of time it's been like 8 years Put the video game out. I actually, I actually majored in it in Plus Plus. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> That's pretty good. Nice work. Speaking of new video games, you played Halo 2. That's right, I did. That hot new release. Is that the only game you played at Fox? That is literally the only game, well, only video game. I played the Gears of War board game. Oh, really? Which is not great. <laughs> played that with Ian and uh, Pasquale. Yeah, not great. Have you? I, I haven't touched any of Was the board good? game stuff. Was it any good? It's terrible. Great. Hear that, Cliff? Or whoever makes Gears of War anymore. Don Matt, no. Everyone's gone. Video games are dead. Yeah. Everyone's left. Uh, what did you think of Halo 2, Drew? Uh, it's, it's it, well, first of all, Danny, it is the Master Chief Collection. <laughs> okay. It is an HD up of Halo 2. Uh, well, it's actually of all of them, but Halo 2 is like the new, the new business of it. But I played Lockout. Okay. The classic Halo 2 map, Lockout, uh, in glorious 60 frames a second which is probably the weirdest part because I don't think, I think those games were 30 yeah, yeah. before. So it's kind of jarring to see that. Um, but it's still, I was able to just drop right back into Halo 2 mode and it feels, it feels great. And it looks great too. What else is in that collection? It's all that obviously single player and, and multiplayer from Halo 2, but there's a bunch more stuff, right? Yeah, as far as I know, it is Halo 1 through 4, mm. all in HD and all the multiplayers. All of the Master Chief games? All of the Master Chiefs. So no ODST? No ODST, no Reach. That's fair enough. No, no, no Halo Wars. No Spartan Ops. <laughs> all, the, all the best ones I left yeah. out. No all units. What the hell's that? Uh, it's from Halo Wars. Okay, okay, that's fair enough. Uh, have you played anything else when you're wandering around or seen anything else that was of interest? Did you go into the Mega Booth? Uh, I did, yeah. I toured around it a little bit. Um, I'm still looking forward to Apotheon. What's that? It's that game that looks like um, Greek pottery art. <laughs> yeah, it looks it looks amazing. What I, do you do in this video game? It's a side scroller, jump around kind of brawler fight dudes. Up in the mega booth? Yeah, it's in the mega booth. There's so much stuff there. You spend like most of your time. We just had Galaxy on the stage earlier today. Yeah, uh, that's coming out in ja uh, January, thankfully soon. Uh, I played. Uh, have you seen Never Ending Nightmares? No, have not. So that's the. Oh wait, yes I have. It's that terrifying like sketch kind yes. of looking thing. Yeah, that is freaky. Yeah, that's uh, Matt Gillenbach's uh, uh, Kickstarter project he did earlier this year. Um, he's the guy who made Retrograde, okay. uh, yeah. which uh, was that sort of... Uh, you could play it with a guitar, I remember. It was like a almost reverse time shooter. Sure. Uh, didn't do that well. Uh, it did poorly, actually. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of um, his, uh, his, his take on the experience after that, because he right. sort of suffers from depression. Uh, and it's a kind of a, the game is basically talking uh, it's you're meant to feel through playing the game some of those feelings and it's really weird because it's 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 you've got uh my, was it my my dragon cancer i forget what's the name of that game I, it's right there i forget it it's, then there's never ending nightmares and then there's that tent with that experience oculus game where you go in and drink tea which was made in burning man so like yeah so like the back of the indie mega booth is just this insane just go and experience emotion that's, center. Yeah, that's always the most exciting booth at PAX. So if you're if you're coming, you should go to the mega, mm. mega booth first. Did you play that game with the the bomb disposal no, stuff? No, I really really want to. Like when Oculus comes out, I'm hoping that one is right there for me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, should we talk a little bit about the rumble? Rumble? No, you want to cut it off? You cut it off because Tate was doing that nonsense, which means the opposite. I'm just getting mixed signals. Who the hell knows? Who won the rumble? Do you want to spoil it for people? Uh, I mean, it was streamed. Oh yeah, good point. But you should watch it. It's you should watch that thing. PAX is all about video games and F1 and Royal Rumbling and enjoy your flight home. Thank you. Juice Scanlon. Thank you. Pleasure. We're going back to the stage. Chris Waters wants to talk about Shadow of Mordor. One shadow. He learns. Good work, Danny. Uh, all right, folks, we do have Shadow of Mordor ready to show you off here with these things that are stuck on my ear. Joining me right here on stage at PAX Prime is Bob Roberts, lead designer on the game from Monolith Software. Uh, is it Monolith Software, or did I say that totally wrong? Productions. Productions. Bob, welcome to the stage. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Uh, first, but before we get kicked off here, uh, do we, here in Sector G, do we have any Lord of the Rings fans here? Nice, nice. 
I would also be yelling, but it would get really loud because I have this microphone thing. Uh, I'm a huge fan, and during E3, uh, you know, we got to see a lot of the game, different sort of aspects of it, and uh, you guys are showing off letting people play here at the show floor as well. Yeah, that's right. And we had uh, had some of you guys in the, in the studio just on Thursday to play the same demo. We're, we're jumping very late into the game, so what you'll see here is like uh, pretty far into the story, pretty far into the sandbox. You're powered up quite a bit. Okay. You got to the point now where you're not just uh, killing everybody, but you can start to choose whether you want to dominate a guy, make him you know your soldier to fight for you, uh -huh. or if you want to just harvest him for the loot. All right, uh, so let's take a look right at it, see if we're going to dominate or harvest for loot or both or Andy, all. It's getting killed right there. Oh, sorry, somebody, the cave rat. So he's going to drop a rune that you could pick up and upgrade your weapon with. We'll see, that's one of the war chiefs. That was one of the big bosses that just got taken down there. This is actually from the, uh, uh, the Thursday uh, event that you guys were playing out at our studio. Uh huh. And uh, it looks like that was, that was the war chief, but he's got three bodyguards. And this guy right here is actually uh, one that they dominated. The blue there indicates that he's dominated. So this is their guy. He just became the new war chief, and it, it looks like they're going to probably send him on a mission. I'm going to send him to start mixing things up because your goal here, and this this sort of like a, you know, lineup of all these different orcs is is the hierarchy that you've worked your way through to get to the war chiefs. Exactly. Yeah. And and all these guys are dynamic. They're procedurally generated. So mm -hmm. these are all the bosses in this area, but you're never going to have the same bosses twice. Like if you play the game a second time, your friend's game a hundred times in, they're all going to be different. So in this case, they just uh, they branded one of those bodyguards so that they had a man on the inside that went after his war chief and uh, took him out. So his, their guy takes over, and now they're sending him off on a riot to start some chaos for them. All right, so they're set, you've set one war chief in action to, to meddle things up with the other, uh, and now sort of escape to a glowing white tower. That's that right, back in the open ethereal. world here. You can fast travel between these towers. They're, this is part of the, uh, the dual protagonist character we've got, you know, inhabiting the same body. You've got Talion, the ranger of the Black Gates, mm -hmm. who's killed right at the beginning of the game, but he's not allowed to die. He's brought back from death over and over by Celebrimbor, who's the wraith inhabiting him, who's the, uh, actually the elf from the Second Age that forged the Rings of Power with Sauron. So he's a pretty powerful dude. Pretty powerful dude. And he's groundhog daying you in like the worst <laughs> way possible. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or, That's a verb, by the or way. Or hopefully the best way possible. The best way possible, perhaps. <laughs> I mean, maybe for Talion's mental state. It's not super <laughs> great, but uh, certainly for us, it gives us an awesome chance to romp around um, this lovely looking Mordor, which, and that's one of the more striking things that I think for me, you know, coming into it right away, you know, I, I knew you guys were in a different era than sort of what I, we'd seen on this, in cinema, of course, but Mordor is a very diverse, geologically, ge ge That's geographically right. diverse place. Yeah, I mean, the, the point at, at which in the lore that we're kind of tackling it, uh, Sauron's actually been away from Mordor for thousands of years, so it's had that time to kind of grow back and become a beautiful wild frontier again. Yeah, it turns out not having, like, the Lord of All Evil hanging out in you uh, <laughs> is good for the complexion. Exactly. So now he's just coming back, just starting to industrialize and rip everything apart again. So we get a, a little window into the fertile kind of the landscape where you could still feed his armies before he strips it bare. Where you just tried to do a, we just tried to do a stealth attack, but it turned out that that character was invulnerable to stealth. That's right. Is yeah. that something you can sort of recon ahead of time, or is that just like going to be a random roll on that enemy and whoops, now you gotta, now you yeah. gotta get get loud. If you if you put the time in to strategize, every every boss has a weakness, has some kind of way you can exploit to, to take him out. Mm -hmm. So you can grab the other orcs in the uh, in the world and dominate them and peer into their minds to get the intel on guys and then study their strengths and weaknesses. So. That's it's something that keeps the game fresh, too. The fact that these guys are all procedural means they all get different strengths and weaknesses every time you play, and you have different boss fights. And, and so what you end up here, like, this is the, the mechanism, right? You go into their mind like that, and then you can find out about some of the other captains and war chiefs. So let's say you're a really excellent stealth player. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some of these guys that are vulnerable and, to that. And I am, Bob. No, <laughs> that, definitely not. <laughs> but you'll always bump into to somebody along the way who's going to challenge that, who's going to be invulnerable to it. And the same was true about combat and ranged and uh, using the beasts. That's another big part of the sandbox is making just chaos with the wildlife. And that's you were talking before uh, the demo started about the, diff about the terms open world and sandbox. And the latter kind of implies that really getting your hands in there and messing around and like sort of being able to influence things in, in ways to create unexpected situations. Exactly, yeah. We, we use both terms for this game a lot because open world clearly implies the like freedom of movement and navigation, explore where you want and all that, and mm -hmm. that's definitely the case here. But we, we also like the term sandbox a lot because it's just this, 
this you know toy set. It's got all these little little bits and parts that you start to feed into the systems. They start to play off of each other, and you can create all kinds of crazy, unexpected, emergent moments. That's what's going to be the most fun for us once we launch. Is it's the same thing that made it fun to work on for years. You get crazy stories that you never thought possible that just keep coming up to surprise you. I can't wait to watch people's like stream videos and screenshots. And see all the, all the shenanigans yeah. that ensue. Well, speaking of story, what we're taking a look at now is uh, sort of a section from the story and uh, part of it that involves a familiar face. Yeah, so, uh, so this mission here is uh, the first story mission we've been showing. Uh, give you a little glimpse into what that part of the, the game is like. Actually, the, uh, the narrative of the game is non-linear as well. It was uh, written by the lead designer writer on Red Dead Redemption, Christian Canamessa. Oh, uh, Red so Dead, I love that game. That was a huge win for us to get him on board and work yeah. with him on the structure and style. So it's also non-linear like Red Dead, uh, but he has a lot of fun, uh, fun characters to work with. And Gollum is a great one. Uh, it's actually very similar to Seth from Red Dead, but uh, <laughs> he's, you know, at this point in the lore, Gollum's just had the ring stolen from him from the filthy Trixie Bilbo and he's off into Mordor in search of it. This is where he ends up in the lore at this time. So that's where we get to cross paths with him. And of course, you're inhabited by the maker of the Rings of Power, so you have this deep connection to the, you know, one of the ring bearers, Gollum. Oh yeah. Uh, so he's kind of leading you around the environments. Uh, he's trying to find these artifacts, these heirlooms of Celebrimbor, that when you find them, they sort of jog his memory and help him remember who he was and help him regain his power. So that, that's the mission we're showing here is you get uh, following Gollum's tracks, going in and out of the physical world and Wraith world to keep track of him and then work your way into try and find one of these artifacts and learn about Celebrimbor. Okay, and then, so so coming out of this, by the way, that, that orc, what, I mean, what would you, is that like a That's a Grog. He's a orc, massive kind of super predator in Mordor. It's like twice the size of a troll. A Grog? Grog. Grog. Like Smaug, but with a Gur. Ah. Uh, like so, you know, that's here. Actually, this is a good example of the ecosystem in action. You got the bait there, it's gonna attract some Karagors who are like big lion, big cat type predators. Uh -huh. But of course that gets his attention too, so he's gonna come rushing in and start a fight with them, which gives you the chance to sneak into his cave. <laughs> Just jet on by yeah. because no one wants to run into a Grog. Yeah, especially so on a Grog's home turf. So you can see the cave here, like this is another part of the sandbox is you've got the mountains have these cavern systems and caves that you can explore, find collectibles, find crazy beasts in here. Uh -huh. uh, so we're going to sneak through here and uh, and eventually you'll probably see him use Wraith World again to track Gollum and also maybe find some artifacts, pick up some stories from the thousands of years of layered history that have built up in Mordor. It's in there, yeah. Are these like growglings? So these little these guys little are rude. <laughs> yeah, these guys, if they, get, if they escape, if you don't get them before they get back into their pits, they'll come back out with a crazy swarm and just overwhelm you, so... A crazy swarm coming out of the walls in a cave. Sounds like my nightmare. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, definitely a, ne a neat sort of threat because I, there, there are a lot of diverse threats to you. I mean, from the wildlife to the sort of towering grouts, all the, all the diverse orcs and all that. It's re There's really a lot of nefarious forces to deal with. That's right. And, and on top of the, uh, the sort of diversity in the wildlife and, and uh, the basic orcs, the fact that the nemesis system is like building all these different kind of specific strengths and weaknesses means those orcs are pretty infinitely varied as well. That mm -hmm. you've got such a broad array of, of uh, sort of strengths and weaknesses to deal with, to, to strategize around. So this, this is sort of going bef between the Wraith world and the not Wraith actual world, not Wraith world. The physical world. Physical world, yeah, there we go. That. Uh, that allows you to do a, do a little investigation along this storyline. Now is this, are these, do these branches, I mean this sort of cave here, is this a part that you'll only sort of have access to when you're taking on the story or no, will you be able to come back around to this place? It's all open-ended and we want you to really have the freedom to explore and do this stuff whenever you want. And mm -hmm. the, the story missions take place inside the open world, but of course, there's a lot of other things going on in that in that space beyond just that kind of the character, the narrative. So you know you'll always be able to grab those collectibles to deal with uh, the things that would be there otherwise. And maybe if you spot something you just didn't have time to get because you were busy on the story mission, you can try and remember, come back and pick it up later. All right. Well, certainly lots to do in the open world sandbox of Mordor in Shadow of Mordor. Uh, Bob, we've we've seen some good chunks of this game, and they're, they're just whetting my appetite for more. Uh, when, when are you guys releasing the game? What's the release date and That's, on what platforms? It's coming out on September 30th on PS4, Xbox One, PC, 360, PS3. Fantastic. Yeah, can't wait. That's like a month away. 
Yeah. Are you excited to launch this thing? We are all very pumped. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. Bob. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks a lot. Talking Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor. And uh, now we're going to take a look at some of the indie games on the show floor with Sean McInnes and Mary Kish. I was walking around looking at just anything that caught my eye. And everyone knows Monaco. It's like for the people anyway, so they were showing it off. But it turns out right next to it, they were showing off Lead Over Fire. But it's in the same style. I love how they do this. He's known for kind of taking complicated game mechanics and reducing them down to like one or two button types. Sure. Simplifying the crap out of them. That's pretty much what Monaco is. Like a complicated heist game made simple and frantic and fun. That's exactly right. It's kind of like this real-time strategy, RTS style, uh, like StarCraft, but he reduced it to two buttons. It's the same thing where you have to start building your foundation. With this one, you're slaughtering pigs to get products. Then you can start um, raising units. The units are ridiculous. They're, you start out with like rats. You can move on to flying donkeys and you're attacking the other person's base to ultimately defeat them. All right. Well, I also saw an animal-themed game called Bear Zerkers. Go on. It's a competitive local action game where four players play armadillos, of course, and these armadillos are rolling around this map. And these maps are kind of laid out in such a way where they encourage like kind of like continuous looping around through like common like choke points and that type of thing. The twist here is that you're all trying to run away from a murderous and a bear. You're all rolling around and your basic ability is, as armadillos, you can kind of like dig this little trench in the ground that creates this kind of like dirt wall that actually blocks off these other players. So when two of you are trying to run away from a bear and the other player is a little bit farther behind, you can seal him off at a choke point and he's stuck and the bear comes and devours him and he loses a life. So the whole thing is just about like finding like these movement patterns throughout the map and just trying to sabotage other players. This is really a show for the people. It's about seeing things that you might not have ever seen before, weird experiences, and I had a hell of a weird experience seeing a, a game unlike any other. Uh -huh. uh, it was called Sound Self. Robin Arnault is kind of known for making these pretty whimsical style games that are supposed okay. to make you look internally and think about life, deep stuff. It's hard to do that at that. <laughs> Bear with me here. Okay, okay. Bear with me. Oh, I get it, yeah. Bear with me here. Topical. So I laid down on a subwoofer on my back. I put a device around my neck that gauged the, my vocal cords mm -hmm. and uh, Oculus on my eye, eyes and then a headphones. My voice was changing the game dynamics and telling me to chant to kind of influence the sounds and sights that were happening to me. Uh, all based on my tone and right. the inflections of my voice. I asked him what kind of reactions he's been getting from people, and he said most of the time, people don't know how to react <laughs> because they're so like blown away by this weird experience that they're really not sure right. what to say. He's actually had people come out of it crying. He's had people coming out of it excited and or like super zened out. And it's it was a unlike anything else that I've ever experienced. Like very interesting visual colors with a unique experience for me, and I think that's something cool that most people probably don't ever get to right. experience the past. Yeah, I mean that's one thing that I really like about the indie mega booth is that you can find those weird off-kilter, off-beat games. Like I found one called The Magic Circle. <laughs> so it is a video game um, about making video games. Okay. Which is already super meta. Um, and so this game is actually about like this legendary vaporware product that's just like exists in the ether and has just never been finished and you you get into it and you're a player in this world and you actually like hear dialogue between two different developers working on it and they're constant constantly bickering with each other suddenly out of nowhere this voice appears who tells you you know what this is a great opportunity you need to take advantage of this situation you can actually finish this game or just sabotage it if you want to. Doesn't matter, it's up to you. It's a world that's ready to be exploited. Interesting. So that manifests itself in very interesting ways. Like any object in the game, you can actually like freeze it and then like jump into its AI profile 
and actually like swap out its different kind of like alliances and abilities and things like that. So like one thing I did in the game was take these like little dog creatures that start attacking you, instantly jump in, turn them friendly, make them my pals, and then maybe on one or two of them, I removed their ability to walk, took that kind of ground transportation profile, pocketed it, went to a mushroom, gave it the ability to walk, and suddenly I have like a small army of dogs and mushrooms to do my bidding. But that's just like a really small part of it. Like you actually use this stuff to solve really complex environmental puzzles. So it, it all builds up in really interesting ways. And I was talking to the guys and they said that like it's still very possible for players to break the game, but that's also kind of the fun for them. Is that also possibly a way to win because you can <laughs> sabotage the game by breaking? <laughs> he told me it's a game where you can either finish it or you can cancel the game. So I feel like there are different pathways you can take. But once you actually sit down and play it and it all kind of starts to click, you realize this game is really cool and it's doing something totally crazy. I don't know if it has any mass market appeal because it's so meta and inside baseball, but I had a blast playing. That's awesome. It seems like that is a theme here at PAX. I've seen a lot of games that are in their like infant stages. They're not ready yet. Yeah. I'm shocked that they're even showing some of them because they're like very early art stage, but it's about the experience and just enjoying the game. And you're right, a lot of these games might not ever be in stores, but it's it's about that true PAX experience of trying something new and getting getting a really good story out of it. I don't know. Lots to see at PAX Prime, of course, and we've got a, n a new game just announced. <coughs> Your first look at it here live on our stage show. Well, I mean, you maybe have looked at it a little bit over the weekend, but joining me is our Dan and Will from the Behemoth. Guys, big weekend for you, huh? Oh, yeah, it's been great. <laughs> you know, we are unveiling Game 4, which I do want to say is a temporary name. A temporary, it's just well, our fourth. It's a temporary name, but it's Alien Hominid, Castle Crashers, Battle Block Theater, Game 4. Exactly. Uh, yeah. But you guys released this sort of announcement trailer, and if anyone, any of you have ever been to PAX, you know the behemoth, you guys are always a big presence at PAX. People like walking around with your plushies, you guys are on lanyards, wow. you got tons of place, but stations that are always full of people playing your games, so yeah. uh, pretty special for you guys to be showing off a game for here at PAX. For yeah, it's been time. a lot of yeah. fun. And for anybody wondering, what we're calling it is a fast-paced, turn-based co-op fast adventure turn -based. game. Sorry, yeah. I interrupted you. No, in the it's okay. Of it. It's got a lot to it. Fast-paced turn-based co-op adventure game. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's. We're gonna dive right in and get yeah, a look at it. it. But to intro it to you folks, we're gonna take a look at the intro sequence. We're gonna let you hear the voiceover in all its glory, done by. By the way, this man, Will, right over here. Yeah, that's you, Will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I find myself wondering what the world must have been like before the bear crashed into our frail planet, transforming all we once knew into a colorful kaleidoscope of delicious chaos. And I love it. The world was more hospitable, no doubt, more orderly, more sensibly sickening because it sounded boring, and I hate being bored. I can't imagine a world without the bear or the storms, yes, the storms. Beautiful waves of emerald blood cry down from the heavens, promising death in lawless disarray, constantly upsetting the order. I get butterflies in my tummy just thinking about it. Death. Yes! Speaking of which, It's the old stamper in action. <laughs> All right, so here we are, starting off yeah. in the middle of a, one of the storms that the Will storms, mentioned. The storms, my friend. Yeah, this is Horatio, the blueberry farmer, and his, um, he's about to experience some of the chaos that all the bear, space bear blood is creating. Um, <laughs> one thing I want to show off is the um, I'm how sorry. simple... I'm sorry, space bear blood raining down, <laughs> causing all sorts of chaos. I love it. It's mixing space and time as we know it, and <laughs> Horatio is having to deal with some of that. Um, so one thing that's really big on the game here is the movement system. It's uh, mechanically very simple. You can see as you move the cursor around, you can see your potential path. You hit A, and then you hold down Y and execute your turn. Love them hexes. 
Um, so a lot of it's really streamlined. We'll get to that in a second. This is our first hard counter in the game. Mm -hmm. So heavy shields are really good at blocking arrows. Most arrows, not all. They'll still get through. You got some. Not It won't block all the arrows. Uh, so are you, is the player then tapping a button here, or is there, it's sort of a uh, oh, no, super yeah. defensive status? Um, yeah, he's not doing anything. He's not doing anything. Yeah, it's just, just the strategic. waiting for the uh, enemies to uh, take their turn. Right. So now, same thing, movement. He says, let's go here. And Horatio automatically decides, well, I got a sword. I might as well use it. <laughs> yeah, right. So we're trying to streamline. It's more of a game of positioning. Oh, than okay. it is choosing an ability and then a target and, and yeah, all that because it's, that it, adds it's up. essentially like chess if you want to think of it that way as opposed to getting next to a guy and then pausing the game with your equipment you, menu and then having to go through and like, I think I'll put this on. okay let's get back to the fight now yeah you, you might have seen right there Horatio he went between two guys right there that are bordering him yep and you don't know which one he's gonna hit because he can now potentially choose between two guys so if you want to choose your target you want to get to their flank and you can focus fire on units that way with multiple guys. You and know, we just you lost know the two stuff. options. Oh my god! <laughs> oh yeah, his I was just gonna just say, died. oh sweet, all those enemies <laughs> are gone. But, yeah, uh, it was looking up for him for a second there. But probably not for long. This, uh, as we could tell from the opening intro, not right. like a, a happy world. Not no. a wonderful place. And no, it's a horrible place to live. It's a horrible place it's, to live. Well, if you were to take all time and space as we knew it and put it in one spot, I think there'd be a lot of stuff that wasn't. It'd be a little Very chaotic. Good. It'd be a little messy, and there would be space bear blood. Yeah. So we're, we're getting a look at our world map here for the first time. And uh, so you can look around, and then you can just move wherever you need to go. Thankfully, it's very well marked in the beginning. <laughs> Horatio is just trying to take cover. He's, he's out in the bear rain. That's a terrible idea. So he's just trying to get somewhere. And look, it's his shelter. We all know what happened to that. And we got another cinematic right here. Horatio shared his blueberries. Hey, I know you got it. No, you shared your berries. Huh? How generous of you. How did you her win? name was Pipistrella, and though she looked more than capable, she requested Horatio's aid. You see, her castle was raided by grumpy warriors, and she doesn't like that very much. Go on, my little hero. Perhaps this could become a mutually beneficial relationship. So there we meet Pipistrella. Who's talking? Who's that guy? <laughs> That's this guy right here. I mean, here. I know it's you, but like, who are you in this game? The the narrator, or is this one oh. of the mysteries? You know what, man? You'll find that out later. Yeah, right? that's <laughs> oh, all right. All right. That's not clear to us yet. He really secrets. loves the chaos, though. He's really into this for some reason. He definitely is. Um, so Pipistrella, she's got different stuff than Horatio. She's got a heavy mallet and a light sword. So that heavy mallet is a big deal here. We can see. It's going to bash the heck out of helmets, and oh, helmets yeah. are our defense in the game. Whereas Horatio's sword. Not going to do so good, uh -huh. but there's some archers off to the right there. And so we're going to keep Horatio closer to the archers, so he draws their fire, and Pipistrella is going to smash the heck out of that helmet there. And you might see that she's making gold while she does that, too. Making gold? What are you going to do with gold when the world has turned to horrible bear rain chaos? It's going to mean something. <laughs> People still pay for stuff when the world is undone. I guess yeah, that makes sense. there's still a what currency. would survive? Currency, you know. It's the post-apocalyptic capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, yeah, I don't Some know. Some things never New change. New gear. I mean, you know, Horatio could use a hat. As much as that mustache is wonderful. Or a yeah. helmet. Yeah. And that's actually something. In a little bit, we'll show you. You can customize characters and things like that. So these guys aren't totally tied in. Um, we'll show you that a little bit later. All right. Um, I really do like Pipistrella's adorable little shields. <laughs> yeah, and it those doesn't. Those guys have little bucklers too. Oh, that's so cute. It doesn't do that much, but you know, sometimes it does. Every little bit helps, I guess. <laughs> They're tiny yeah. bucklers. Yeah, I didn't even notice that. Her whole entire army is dead. You can see them all dead on the ground there. That's because they use swords. So just a bad idea against helmets. Unfortunately, they didn't know that. And Horatio's in a bit of a tight spot if she hadn't 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 run into her. So. You're controlling both characters here. Right, you can move Help both of your characters and before then locking they'll in. take the same turn. They'll, they'll move at the same time that your turn will play out. Sure. Yeah, they'll, yeah, they'll head out and do their thing. And The neat thing about this game is there's counterattacks, there's criticals, there's misses, there's dodges. There's all kinds of stuff that you just can't be prepared for, and you got to just work with the chaos. Yeah, every match ends up different. And you're even talking about, I mean, even with the positioning, you know, if you're next to two enemies, there's uncertainty about which one you're going to tag. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, you might prefer to strike one over the other, but uh, let's 
I guess Horatio is going to do what Horatio is going to do. Yeah, yep. you never know. Like, for instance, here's what? a space shuttle. So space and time's all messed up. They're misusing a space shuttle as their getaway vehicle. Because it just, it was there. It was there, I guess, it was you know. <laughs> you got to make do with it what It was there, and the got. keys were in the ignition. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're going to head up to the city here. Um, because we still have to take cover. The castle is not in a very good shape. When you are taking cover, you want the cover to not be on fire. Is like a general tactical rule. Yeah, right? you definitely want to work yeah. that out. Unless you're immune to fire, in which case it's not so bad. In which case you're all good. Uh, what were those, those little zombies? So there's some there? zombies, there's some cupcakes, there's robots, there's all kinds of stuff. <laughs> They're all Everything from time and space yeah. is here. So there's some, yeah, you can see, oh, look at that. And then, so... We've made it to the city, and it, it's got a little prompt there. It says, if you're lost, press B. Let's try it so we can show off our, what we call our breadcrumb system. <laughs> so if the world map's huge, and if you get lost, you can leave yourself a little trail of breadcrumbs. <laughs> That's poop. Breadcrumbs. Oh, wait, you, you know, bread, just, breadcrumbs gets eaten. you pooping on the ground right now? Yeah, mm. but if you were lost in a forest, and you left breadcrumbs on the ground, do you think they'd stay there very long? You know? Yeah, that's, that's true. We've thought of, of everything. Forest like to eat breadcrumbs, <laughs> less like to eat poop, I would imagine. Yeah. So I mean, there's probably something that likes to eat poop in this world. Right? Yeah. Yeah, there's all of space and time. <laughs> that could be true. <laughs> but we don't we haven't seen it yet. Yeah. So Horatio and Pipistrella they need to make some gold. Uh -huh. And so they've gone to the arena, but they need a third fighter and conveniently this half cyclops was outside and he says, "Do you want to join souls?" Let's say no cuz that's weird. That's intense. And he's, well, so oh, you he, want to, he, he's trying to please us. He's trying to intense. No, he's like, let's say no again. maybe more beard than Mohawk. I guess he had, okay, so hair. let's join Souls with the half Cyclops. Who? I mean, nothing could go wrong, right? What? I mean. So let's get in there and sure. just get some golds. This place is was bumping, by the way. The, yeah, oh like yeah. The city, you know, even though yeah, stuff's going down, psyched. the city's still got a good spirit People about still it. like their blood sport. Oh yeah, you know, they... <laughs> They don't know any different. They don't leave the walls. Um, so here we see oh Yosef's in a bad spot. Yeah. Horatio says, oh, maybe I should be up there to soak up that fire. And we can see Yosef is able to throw his axes and has a chance to stun. He can get in there and melee. It's just not as good of an idea for him. So what we're going to do is put Horatio in front of Yosef and have Yosef throw axes from the back line and hopefully stun that guy with the Uzis because... Because he's a jerk. Because Uzis, Oh, there man. it is. Perfect. Who brings Uzis to a medieval battle fight? So we were able to focus fire a unit just because he missed, he made a misstep. So there's a, there are ways to, you know, all go for one guy there. Mm -hmm. And and it's all about picking at your targets and seeing who's weak. We can see Pipistrella. She still hates helmets. So she's going to go after the guy with the helmet. Oh, so she has sort of a... If she give, if she's given the choice between two strikeable enemies, will she go for helmet generally? Or no, is that no. Still we just, Aaron, just Aaron, who's helmet. driving in the back, just decided he's gonna go for what's strategically sound. You yeah. can totally make the wrong decisions. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, we, we, we love we love to let you guys make all the wrong decisions. We you allow want. you to do that. That's very yeah, kind of you. That's part of the <laughs> part of the process. Um. But yeah, you, so, so you do have to choose targets. You know, for the melee units, you choose the target by walking next to it. And for the ranged unit, you get to pick a target specifically. Yeah. So there's there's a whole system where as you're moving that A around, yeah. the target reticles will light up on who's a potential target. So you can move Yosef around and see. Can we do that for a second, Aaron? Can we show? Yeah. Yeah. So see how. Okay. The, the same blinking. thing for Yosef. If he's in range, you'll see. Oh, he can strike that guy. Okay. Uh, now, I'm seeing a lot of numbers pop up as the arrows are coming in and these heroes are yep. taking it like a champ. But I'm, all, but I'm not seeing any health bars on screen or anything like that. You, you will. Okay, all right. That's you true. will. That's, we're just so still early days here. I can, I'll actually, I can go into that right now, actually. So, um, Yosef is, a, is part of Cyclops lore, and Cyclopses can see the future because they traded one of their eyes to the gods. But all they could see is when they were going to die. Yosef um, just knows how dead he is. And you join souls with him, and you just made that official by killing each like killing things in the arena. Oh yeah, you so now you can together. see it too oh, all in right. the next fight. So that's that's why you can see that. It sounds like you should try to get more and soulmates. We, we yeah. just made a bunch of uh, gear from our fight. Oh wow! And now after we choose who's going to be our hero, and all of them are an okay choice. They just hit harder and they have more health. You can pick anybody you want. 
Um, the Emperor gives us a house because we fought so awesomely. Oh, wow. And in the house, this is where the game starts to really open up. This is where you can see a lot of the potential. Along the bottom, you can see there's four more slots down there. We only have three guys right now. Uh huh. And you can see Aaron, Aaron's customizing uh, his guys. You can say, you know what, I want Pipistrella to be something else. You can do that. Or you can just be like, you know what, I want the banana uh, mallet instead of the regular mallet. Oh, of course you guys would have weird weaponry. <laughs> I love it. The large nanner. <laughs> yeah, and so you can just, I mean, you can pretty much do um, whatever you want with the gear that you find. So we just gave you kind of the baseline of how it works, and then you're allowed to do any kind of strategy you want. And there's other creatures in the game, like you saw some of the cupcakes and the zombies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can put those on your team if you get some. Oh, really? You yeah, can so you can mix and yeah, match. Yeah, you can capture them out in the wild, yeah. Yeah, you can mix and match all you want. So the emperor says, oh, you know, um, I gave you a house you owe me. You got to take care of these guys out by the beach. Indentured. <laughs> and so it's our first quest. So the quest system it oh, shows look, you the got a arrow. Caravan? Yeah, yeah, totally. You can fill the wagon with stuff and all that, but we'll get into that a little bit later oh, on. Oh, there's the bear. Yeah, there he is. With his yeah. star nipples. And you see, you know, the arrow will tell you where to go on your quest, and uh, you can just you can fight that guy. That's actually what a full cyclops looks like, but he's oh. got a helmet on. You can't see his eye. Uh, right. That's a big cyclops. Uh, quick question. This is very important logistically. Uh huh. The breadcrumbs that you leave when you are in a caravan, is it the poops of the beasts pulling the caravan or the poops of the people inside the yeah, caravan? Yeah, so the beasts in the caravan can yeah. infinitely poop. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. The people uh, are pooping in the caravan. The beasts are leaving it on the ground. They're supplement. Yeah, they're keeping it inside. So you can okay. see down there, there's the <laughs> HUD. You can see the health, how far they move. Oh, and then there's go. the purple bar. The purple bar is experience. Yeah. So as every time you are to hit someone on a turn, you gain some experience. And if you get that last hit of that guy, you get a big bonus. Um, leveling up in this game will heal you. It's the only way to heal in a fight, aside from a unit that heals, <laughs> right? Uh, other units. Uh, but the, the priestess cupcake. Like the cupcake. That you find later the cupcake on? heals other units, for instance. <laughs> but these guys have to rely on their own experience. Just when they level up, they're gonna fully heal. So you can have a guy soak up a bunch of damage and then have him level up like it meant nothing. And he then it's all good. And he's stronger. So. And so <laughs> it's, I mean, the way you're talking about it, it seems like it's not just going to be something that comes along as a nice bonus during combat and you're like, oh great, I'm glad that happened, but something you would actively strategize yeah, to you have could, your you weak could, player land that last hit. You exactly. could pull an entire match back and have one guy left and take out the whole team of people if you level up at that if right moment. If you're chaining the levels together. It, yeah. gets, it gets really interesting. There's some very interesting mechanics in, in just how fundamentally different this is where if you have low level characters, you have an advantage in certain ways that they're going to be able to heal during the fight. Whereas a super high level guy is not going to have as much of a chance to level. Well, not nearly as much actually. And uh, he'll be, you know, beefier and all that. But if you if you want to rely on that kind of thing, uh -huh. you need lower level guys. So you got to keep getting new guys and stuff. If yeah, you there's no way that. to the only way to like restrict your own leveling would be to not get the maybe not get the killing blow as often. Right. Uh, so it, maybe it behooves you to do that. Yeah. So you, I mean, Murder, however you want to, or you can power XP. level someone on your team and let them keep getting the last hit. However you want to like shape it is. It's all up to you. I mean, you could bring all mallets. You could bring all bows. Um, there's a lot of hard counters in the game, so that might be really bad if you do that. But you're welcome to try out anything. <laughs> And that's like, where the like game you really said before, you're up. welcome to make bad decisions. You can do it, yeah, <laughs> and you can learn. You know, if you lose a character, it's okay because they're, they'll come back in normal difficulty. Yeah, if you okay. run back to the city. Yeah. We do plan on having an insane difficulty, but we haven't quite worked out what that is. Lots of people are suggesting permadeath. I don't know. Sure. You know, that could be scary. That could, that could that be really but scary. But permadeath is supposed to be scary. Yeah, it's scary. It's death. Yeah. Um, so we're almost, we've almost got these guys. I'm feeling pretty good about that. Um, so I do want to mention to you that there is co-op. So the way co-op would work is you would have your set of guys and I have my set of guys. Okay. And we would um, take all our moves and then we would both say, I'm ready, you're ready. And then they all of blue would move out and then all red would go. And so it's very similar to the same kind of pace that we're doing here. Now, would it scale up uh, the, in the encounters? Like, is, is the co-op, you could be playing this map co-op, or you could be playing it solo. Yes. It's yeah. just sort of seamless with the, the yes. game? 
Yeah. So the, the game will will balance based on how many guys you have. It yep. doesn't necessarily mean more guys, although it, normally it does. Uh -huh. um, they might be a little more powerful just because otherwise there's no challenge. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the game does scale based on you know how many people you have and and, and all that. And so. of course your progress in you know. We play a little bit co-op, then I'm going to go play a little bit solo. My progress is continuous across the whole Yes, thing. you keep your same guys when you cross into multiplayer or not. Um, there's advantages in, in co-op. You know, you uh, you have more guys that can cover you, and, and you can bring stuff that you've never been able to bring alone. Because if you want to bring all cupcakes, that's not going to work if yeah. you're alone, right? You really but I can support your team, yeah. or I can have, like, I'm going to have a couple of these and a couple of that. and. And we could bring way more giants if we're both together than if we were alone and things like I that. I see. And here's our fourth um, companion. She has no idea what's going on. She didn't know that while she was trying to find the new world that all space and time got screwed up. She was out in the ocean. So she's like, oh, cool. I'm <laughs> I've made it. I claim the land. You want to be my guides? And you agree because, well, you know, why yeah, not? I get. I guess so. So <laughs> she's and super You got hot. a boat. That seems cool. And this is un unfortunately where our, our demo ends. We do have a, a, a video that sort of encapsulates oh, yeah. it pretty short. Uh, so if is we that going to tack on the end here? I'd love to tack that on the end. Let's, let's okay. do that. Let's watch that right here. Thank you for playing. Now go away. No way. Stay. It's only fair to prepare you for yeah, what's you to see. come. You'll find yourself in the city, maybe with a friend, maybe inside your precious little house, customizing your team's looks and strategies. Then it's off you pop to the market to purchase, I don't know, dainty dresses for all your warriors, so they look pretty as little peaches as they prance from epic quest to epic quest, laughing and eating cake, meeting new heroes, getting stronger, maybe getting a little too arrogant, because it's all in vain, and at the end of the day, you're all my precious little puppets, and we're going to have some fun. See you soon. All right, uh, Will, th th doing this kind of voiceover, getting a little maniacal with it, do you ever have, do you ever come out of a session and your coworkers are looking at you a little differently, like, you, you went to a dark <laughs> place there, buddy. No, it's expected by this point. <laughs> they know you well <laughs> enough. Right. We know him. You know, we've been working him for years. and <laughs> It's great because, you know, I'll just give him a bullet point. Hey, we need to convey this. And then he just writes it all, does it all. I never know what I'm going to get. Very cool. That's, that's all right, fun. Dan, Will, fun. thank you guys so much for coming off. Getting our awesome first look at Game 4 from the Behemoth. Uh, Xbox One and Steam, in case you missed it. Xbox One and Steam, you guys have a general timeline? No release date. However, we have held on to this game longer than we usually hang on to our games. This or, is true. So usually, we, you know, Castle Crush, we showed it like four months in. This has been in development about twice or maybe a little bit longer than that. All right. So you don't have to wait as long, I think, because <laughs> we waited longer to show it. Excellent. Well, I'm sure a lot of people are looking forward to getting their hands on it. Thank you guys so Thanks much. For much appreciated. Absolutely. Enjoy the rest of your packs. We'll we are going to be coming back to the stage show, doing a little time bending of time and space of our own for a demo of Mortal Kombat in just a few minutes. But first, Peter Brown is going to talk to us about some indie games. Video games 2014. We're here at PAX. What's up, Chris Waters? Mmm, that behemoth game looks so good. It. The behemoth game looks so good, I just had to get a little bit and shake it off and shake it off. Peter Brown, you spend some time in a hotel room with the creator of Final Fantasy. Tell me about it. Oh, sorry. I was pretty distracted for a second there. Uh, <laughs> shake it off. Oh, man. So many things. Uh, yeah. No, I met up with uh, Hironobu Sakaguchi, the man who created Final Fantasy over mm -hmm. 20 years ago. He has a company called Mistwalker. After he left Square, that happened. He was making a lot of console games. Now he's working in the mobile space. He's got a free-to-play mobile tactical puzzle RPG coming out. What? Yep. Explain to me why I want to know about a free-to-play tactical RPG on a mobile device, Peter Brand. Do okay. it. Well, let's talk about the game first rather than the free-to-play model. So it, Fair. It is a grid-based game where you have a bunch of units on the battlefield. There are units you're competing against. And it's all about aligning things and sandwiching enemies in between your own characters. If you have characters elsewhere on the map that are aligned, it sort of like multiplies the damage. You guys team up. You do really well. There's a lot of depth and strategy to explore there. And it's pretty difficult. But it is free-to-play. And that's not necessarily a bad thing in principle, but the problem is this is one of those games where you can only play for a certain amount of time, right. and then you've exhausted a meter, and you have to wait for it to recharge. Playing the game yesterday, I actually really liked it a lot, and I could see myself wanting to play it for a long time. 
this was really disappointing, and they have no option for a full price release. Would you prefer to spend like thirty dollars and actually just be able to play it? Is it that much of a dis disparity? Do you think? Yeah, I would totally like to do that. I mean, honestly, like it's. It's one of those things where I just want to pay for the game and have the game, and at that point, I'm not really worried about getting my money back. I've already got it. But if I'm thinking about spending real-world money to play a game that's sort of fantasy and not real, I mean, that, those, the intersection of those two things bugs me anyway, you know? So is it, is it like kind of Final Fantasy Tactics is what I'm it's, no, seeing in my head? No, that's like a grid-based game. It's similar, kind of similar to what we saw there. Not, it's a little bit different, but uh, no, this is more of, it's similar to like chess where different pieces that you have affect a single piece of the enemies on the battlefield. Uh, but, you know, what's really good is they have Nobuo Uematsu, the composer who's been with Final Fantasy forever. He's done uh, about 20 tracks for it. Um, and they're doing sort of an interesting thing with it. It, it. They're doing a download starter. So essentially, the more people download the game, the more things they're going to do in terms of adding new content. And one of those things is if it gets to 2 million downloads, they're going to create a full-fledged MMORPG based on this world. What? Yeah, I know. It's very insane. And you it's don't like Nobby Nobby Boy, but with actually making <laughs> games instead of planets. Right, and you don't and you need to spend any money, you just download it, and you're basically contributing towards this effort. It's almost just voting with a little bit of your own effort, yeah. or energy, rather than your dollar. Fair enough. Yeah. Crazy weird. It is weird, it is weird, but it looks fun. And, uh, I mean, he describes it as another branch on the gaming trees, trying to explore whatever, it's a business decision. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm curious to see what he could do with the world, because it's a mix of fantasy, it's a mix of sci-fi. There were 160 characters in the game that all have their own backstory. Uh, all these different nations with their own languages. So it's got a lot of potential. I just want to see it kind of breach that business decision that kind of spurred it along. You know? uh, when's it coming out? Uh, he's not saying just yet. They're not positive. So cool. yeah. All right, 2015, like everything else here at PAX. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, or lastly, before I let you go, you beautiful man, because I know you got a lot of work to do, tell me about your panel last night. It was on at the same time as the Giant Bomb moment, but apparently you still like filled out a massive chunk of this Big ass room. We filled out a decent chunk. Uh, Chris Kohler from Wired has been running the Retro Game Roadshow for a few years. It's like the antiques roadshow that maybe you've seen on TV. People bring in their items, it gets appraised by experts. Apparently, I'm one of those experts. Uh, and uh, yeah, so people brought in some of their rare video gaming items last night, and we appraised them live in front of a studio audience, and it was great. Uh, one of them was a music box that came out during Final Fantasy VII. Uh, it is incredibly high quality. The mechanics are like, perfect, mm. that the wood is made to resonate with music, and it played uh, Ares' theme song from Final Fantasy VII, you know, the, the song that sort of reminds everyone, like, spoiler, oh, she dies, right? Uh, too soon, man. Yeah, boo! Not too soon? Oh, man. <laughs> I think it's only game spotters that are booing, right? <laughs> yeah, it's Sean McInnes. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that, when, no, when uh, Hironobu Gucci was making that game, his mother passed away. Oh, wow. And it's a very... Yeah, you feel bad now, don't you, Sean? Somebody real died, you mother... <laughs> so... A somber event, a somber song from the game, and he had signed the music box across the top, which oh, wow. we kind of thought maybe that that would tarnish the value of it, but if you kind of put it into a, a historical perspective, it actually kind of adds something special to it in a way. So that was pretty interesting. The moment we he cranked it up and turned it on, the whole audience just, everyone's kind of ah. shut down. It was really sad. Was that the rarest thing you saw? Yeah, I mean, that alone is worth $3,000. Wow. Yeah, so uh, it's really rare, it's really high quality, and uh, it was really neat. Cool, crazy. All right, what are you doing for the rest of your packs? We're almost done and dusted here. Uh, I'm paying attention to KG and Afune's panel coming up, the Mega Man creator who's talking about his newest game, Mighty Number no. 9, and there's supposed to be maybe a secret announcement? Cool. We'll find out. Pack secrets right here on GameSpot.com. Uh, but whatever, we're going to do a little time travel here. I'm going to shoot it to myself talking to a dude while I'm wearing a different shirt about Mortal Kombat X. <laughs> Video games. Hello, welcome back to GameSpot's continuing coverage of Penny Arcade Expo 2014. My name is Daniel Dwyer and I'm delighted to be joined by Mr. Adam Urbano. Pleasure. Nether Realm Studios. That's me. You guys are making a new Mortal Kombat game. That's what I hear. I, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, you guys have had a sort of a renaissance in MK of the past like five or six years. Yep. Uh, what's the new challenge with Mortal Kombat X? Uh, the goal is, so with 9 we rebooted the franchise back to the basics. Uh, 2D functionality, really good looking graphics and balance. Mm. With X, the challenge is how do we take that and advance that storyline, all those features, and make it something that is the next true Mortal Kombat game after the reboot. You guys are leaning into that storyline pretty hard. Yes. Came back in MK versus DC, obviously it was a big part of MK9 as well. Now we've got Johnny Cage having babies. <laughs> what the goddamn hell is happening? Uh, so X being sort of a metaphor for uh, 
obviously MKX, the tenth version of the of the franchise, but also the next generation of consoles. Okay. And the next generation of characters. Sure. Uh, so you're going to see a lot of growth through story. It takes place between five and twenty five years. Uh, after the events of MK9, <laughs> so you get to see things like Johnny Cage's uh, daughter Cassie. Yeah, yeah. Is it, can you fight her as Johnny Cage? Uh, yeah, you could. Great. Yeah. yeah. Video games. Uh, we got some. Uh, we got some B-roll of the game here. I, I played a bit of it at uh, Gamescom. You guys unveiled a bunch of new characters as well. Um, talk a little bit the the sort of the new characters that are coming to the franchise because obviously you know Sub Zero, Scorpion, those staples we've already seen a lot of. Yep. So uh, some of the sort of new characters to the franchise overall. Uh, we have Kotal Kahn, sort of an Aztec-based fighter, a lot of powers based upon light and darkness and mm. sort of traditional values. Uh, we have Farah and Tor, my sort of favorite, because you get this giant sort of guy in Tor, and then the little person on his back, Farah. Yeah, it's terrifying. Yeah. I uh, that that, that uh, fatality is awful, <laughs> with, the, with the splitting down the middle. Yeah. yeah uh, it's pretty nasty. Yeah, the next-gen stuff lets us do some pretty cool stuff with our uh, fatalities. Uh, and then you're looking at, uh, we have Devora that we've shown, who's sort of this insect-based character. Uh, a lot of powers based upon little creatures she uses. Mm. Uh, so one of the cool things is we designed them to kind of fit the MK lore. Because uh, we wanted people to sort of immediately recognize these as characters that they feel yes. they've known forever. I feel like the MK lore is pretty broad though. Yeah, well you that's got, true. You got, you got <laughs> ninjas with ice and then dudes with, with freaking... Is Bra does Baraka have a baby? Uh, can't confirm oh that God, yet. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, we're looking at some footage here. Uh, yeah. We got some, uh, well, one very familiar character in Raiden. Uh, and I'm actually, no, on Kano as well, yeah. very familiar too. So this is the, um, one of our newer jungle levels. Uh, and we're seeing an example of Raiden's sort of various powers. Because one, one of the things we've done with this game, one of the big gameplay features is variants. Yeah, so you've like split. Is it every character's got three different sets of, of uh, yep. movesets? So they're, their moveset like, at its core is still uh, shared across characters. Because we yeah. don't want you to have to learn three different Raidens. But they each have these fundamental powers that are unique to each branch, each variation. Uh, and it changes the way you play. So you're going to have uh, more defensive along one particular variant versus something more offensive. Your strategy is going to change. You're going to have different unique specials and abilities. Uh, it's really cool and really fun to balance. Was that ever a worry, considering Mortal Kombat has always been the sort of more accessible of uh, the fighting games, that like you're going to overcomplicate things for people? Yeah, so we're we're very cognizant of that. So we wanted to make sure that this isn't something you could change during gameplay, and that mm. sort of the core mechanic you can still, you know, whatever variant you choose is there. So the variants are sort of more something that affects strategy and gives you additional moves, but if you just want to sort of button mash and just have a good time, it's going to be the same across all the variants. Uh, as well, speaking about the sort of differences between MK and a, and a bunch of other fighting games, you yep. guys have kind of always sat on the periphery of the fighting game community in terms of uh, like um, esports or in terms of like competitive stuff. Is that always a has that been a concern maybe this time around that you guys want to get get in on that? Is that maybe what the variants are kind of well? Uh, MK9 to? actually was our first foray into sort of the technical fighter. It was mm. the Evo. Um, it was an Evo game, and it was something that we were really focused on. You know, getting into that sort of serious market and the credibility. So with MKX, we're taking everything we learned and making sure that everything available for sort of that tournament level player is there because that's something we want. You know, it's the uh, easy to learn, lifetime to master concept. As well as as just sick ass. Oh god, what's he get? That's <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah. Okay. So that obviously is a fatality. Um, next gen fatality where we can do all the things we've always wanted, letting the people that come up with them. Uh, go a little crazy. The, the latest generation of consoles has finally allowed Ed Boon's nasty death fantasies to become real. All of the, well, the team's yeah. fantasies to come real. It's not just Ed no. in a room with a piece of paper just right now. I want Kano to burst through Raiden's head. I want that little girl to slice straight down lady's backs with her, <laughs> with her knife. Um, he's certainly very much kind of the visionary of each fatality. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it's not him alone in a, in a room. I think he appreciates the help. Now, this is a fighting game coming out, and if uh, working in this side of the video games industry is anything, you guys are going to be trickling out details and specifics over the next coming weeks and months. Sounds I'm about assuming. right. Yeah. Uh. So I, I'm going to guess if I, well, I've asked you what characters are coming, mm -hmm. I'm probably, you, you guys have a plan to like start telling people real slow, right? Yeah, we sort of, that's the kind okay. of thing we think about uh, is how to keep people, you know, excited and interested in some of the crazy choices we made on the roster. Babalities? Could be anything. Friendships. Uh, could be anything. God damn it. God damn it. <laughs> All right, that's fair enough. Yeah. Uh, the, another thing, you, uh, when I was playing in Gamescom as well, another thing you guys uh, have done is uh, kind of lean into that environmental um, killing or environmental 
interaction. Interactions, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there was a there was a bit of that in, in nine. At DC, there was sort of the the transition stuff. Yep. There was a bit of nine. Uh, they seem to be a lot more of them, or maybe maybe easier to trigger at yeah. MKX. So it's uh it's something we explored with Injustice. It was a chance to go a little crazy with a new franchise yes. and try things that you know wouldn't necessarily fit in MK. And then we took the stuff that really worked out well, and we kind of adjusted it to fit that MK universe. So you're going to see stuff all along the fight line that you can just play with, and it's really easy to use. Just, you know, R1, and mm. you suddenly go and throw a tree or uh, jump off of an object. And there's traps, there's offensive, there's defensive stuff, and it's super sort of casual accessible, but you can do things like combo into them mm. uh, and, and use them as part of your attacks if you're more of an advanced player. Yeah, I remember seeing one in the jungle stage where it was a, it was a vine hanging down, and it actually enables you to sort of leap across, mm -hmm. which is kind of a, a new yeah, yeah. It's like almost like moving around the, the map has changed. The idea level. is to give you sort of take away some of the advantages that you would typically have. Like if you're in a corner, there's a lot of interactables that let you escape that yes, corner. Yeah. So, yeah, so you're not getting pummeled all the time. Uh, so we really enjoyed that chance to kind of scatter those objects like that tree stump which just glowed all across the sort of fight line. Uh, yeah, and here we are looking at two uh, fan favorites, Scorpion and Sub-Zero. Um, how do you take a guy like Scorpion specifically who I guess people are used to an entire move set of and yep. then almost like, maybe not nerf him, but like split it up. Like I know like Sub-Zero can now throw his ice clone in one of the yep. modes. Uh, what's it, yeah, do you think that my like, fans will be a bit maybe irked that they can't do like teleportation moves as well as flame moves or So we've been really careful to make sure that the core, you know, the core character even before you pick your variant has all the stuff that people sort of relate to the character. The core stuff you would know from, you know, MK1 in the arcade, that mm. classic feel. So you're still going to it's you're going to have your traditional sort of scorpion throws spears and and his teleport, but it's the addition of new moves you get. Uh, in the variants, that way we're not sort of breaking that traditional character because we're obviously very sort of aware of of what these characters are and how important they are to keep, you know, perfectly classic. Uh, you guys had this um, playable for press and stuff at Gamescom. Is yep. there is a playable on the show floor at all? No, sadly, it's still holding it back. Still holding it back. Uh, a lot of the reason is there's stuff that we're super excited about that we're just not quite ready to show. Okay. Um, so once we get that together, uh, we'll be ready to go. Soon and very soon. I yeah. like it. Uh, w yeah, what's that like, I guess, getting a game like MKS in into people's hands? Like, you've been involved in the franchise for, for a while now. Yep, since uh, MKDC. How important is it, like, that sort of aspect of it, of, like, actually watching people play? Oh, uh, it's almost painful until you get to that point just because we're so excited to get people's hands mm. on it, and especially as we sort of hit the balance stage and sort of tune and learn about it. Um, we bring in people, uh, so we have a group of you know either uh, people we just invite or tournament players that we get to have mm. get that early look and help us. And then once we hit the show floor, that's when the fun magic happens. And you'll see us just standing there watching for hours because it's you know you learn a ton and it's really cool to see he how people focus on stuff we didn't necessarily think they would. Yeah. Cool. Oh. Uh, Raiden here, fighting a new character. Yeah. So that's uh, that's Kotal Khan. So that's the Aztec based character uh, that is new. Khan in the surname. Does that mean that he or she is some sort of I don't know important top tier character? Uh, they're all important. <laughs> no, in terms of the 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 tower. In terms of the is there any Shao Kahn? Uh, no. Okay. There's uh, he's it's just Kotal Khan, uh, sort of more as that South American Aztec reference more than okay, any specific gotcha. character. I thought it was like a son or a cousin it, or a nephew. Yeah, most people do. So, okay. uh, no, he's all new and again, he's designed so that he feels like somebody who would have been around forever, that sort mm. of brutal look. Oh and there man. you're seeing sort of some of what brutal means, particularly for this character. Yeah, just throw a friggin' barrel full of lemons at him. Yep, uh, so that's some of the interactions. Uh, and then here you're seeing the variations on the characters. This is a good yeah, example. This, this one's a crazy one. This is like you can almost make sort of like I don't know, barriers yeah. out of multiple like lightning bolts. It's, I love that one. So it's it's very much focused around defense and traps and hiding. So you're seeing him like bring up these ice, uh, sorry, these uh, electric little balls that mm. become defensive units around you, and where you place them and how you use them uh, becomes sort of <laughs> the core of that character. <laughs> so yeah, him using the power of the sun in that case. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that'll do it. Kick to the jaw. Is that massive tiger in the background interactive? It is Great. actually. Uh, you can jump off his head, um, and maybe at some point he gets angry. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. So there's Kotal Khan's X, right? Oh god, that's the that's the worst. Like, how is he able to fight after that? It's ridiculous. Uh, largely because if I'm not giving out about Mortal Kombat's realism. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be much fun if no. <laughs> first hit they'd be dead. So uh, here we're gonna see another one. Oh god. Oh, that is just the worst. 
Yep. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Love it. Yep. Rain wins. So, uh, fatality is obviously always being a big focus of MK and a lot of fun to make. So, a lot of new tech went into making sure that you know, Ed and the team can do whatever they want. Excellent. So. Uh, and when will players be able to do whatever they want? It's coming out on a bunch of platforms. Uh, uh, when are we going to be able to play Mortal Kombat X? Uh, sort of the window of 2015. Okay. <laughs> so we're gonna be you're gonna be teasing out that those details over the next uh, couple of weeks. That's one of the fun things that people get to learn very hopefully very soon. Okay. Put Baraka in it. Okay. If you're still taking yep. suggestions. Perfect. Baraka has a kid yep. with reptile. All right. Okay. Done. Babalities. Yep. Friendships. Animalities? No, not animalities. Right. Eh, okay. Maybe. Friendships. Yep, okay. Yeah. Uh, Is that okay? I, I will email Ed right after this. Great. Uh, so, I guess that's in the game. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Adam Urbano, that Love Studios. Thank you very much for coming on our stage show. Take and yeah, enjoy the rest of the packs. Cool, thanks so much. And with that, our last live demo of the PAX Prime live show live. Is dead. Uh, we're uh, going to wrap things up uh, here at Sector uh, G while Danny tries to double uh, double open. My mom cans. told me. My mom told me not to bite my fingernails. Do it. No, oh, I can't do you. Oh God! Just Danny, Danny O'Dwyer, Mary do you want me to Kish. Get yours? Mm. I could use one of these Pax Blue ribbons. I'm right drinking now. healthy water. Nice work. That's very good. <laughs> Hydration <laughs> and fun. Cheers. <laughs> All right, PAX is a, our live show from PAX is a wrap, but PAX is PAX. still going on all afternoon, PAX. all day tomorrow. Right there. Uh, mm. But you guys, what have you, what's, what's been your thing so far? You've been all, you've been about out and about, been doing hosts and panel stuff. Yeah. You guys have all been around a lot. Yeah, we started off, uh, the two of us had panels the first day, which was kind of, uh, I thought that was the best, it was good to get them out of the way. Oh, because yeah. I think we were about like pretty, nervous or anticipating them a little bit couldn't have planned it better i'm yeah. so glad and it was really good to start it start it with a bang like have a really awesome uh ladies and gaming panel and yep. then went right over to lose horribly <laughs> and both you guys it wasn't Danny's that panel. horribly <gasps> we did we were not last we were so good at star wall we i don't were understand not last. yeah what happened I don't, the tournament you know. was not set up in a, in a in a legitimate way which would you know because you guys actually did all right in star wall and like yeah, I don't yeah. know. Like it giant was fun though. Uh, so are we p cutting together a video of that? We Can are. We, uh, we had a disaster this morning where we think the memory card corrupted. So Andy is currently Ooh. in the back uh, trying to uh, recover it. So those Andy. are those Andy. background <laughs> video terrors that no one realizes yep. happens. And it always <laughs> happens with the one you really, really didn't want it to happen. That's so the sorry, most important sorry one. for the delay because we weren't in a, in a streaming. And room. I think the stream of uh, women surviving and thriving yes. in games media is up. It's up. It's up and, and ready for view. Way Excellent. more organized than me. <laughs> <laughs> Way more on point. Uh, all right, so send folks off. Tell, tell me one thing they should check out or one thing with a highlight for you guys at PAX uh, as a way of closing the show out here. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to have to say <laughs> that go. even though the panels were fantastic and I was happy to be a part of them, the highlight was clearly playing Evolve and kicking Chris's butt. If I could what? just get a close up. Oh no. Um, I'm cracking. Chris is the medic. Oh really? Uh, this? He's running away right now. <laughs> uh, like all a my friends are dead. And I eat him right There's there. There's a giant crocodile. Uh, that's oh. the winning screen Thanks. when I murdered Chris. Yeah, that was it felt yeah, it must really have, good. It must have felt really good to beat a tiny medic with a fucking huge monster man. I ate all your comrades. <laughs> Did you literally eat them? Because when I beat you and your friends, <laughs> I killed you, and then I ate the corpse <laughs> and looked you in the eye while okay. I did it. You're a How can you look me in the eye when you're eating my I was eyes? I'm eating other people's corpses. The, <laughs> the eyeballs, they're eating. I don't know. Evolve, a lot of fun. <laughs> so much fun. Definitely the best for me. It's always the best. Uh, Indie Mega Booth, Indie so Mega good. Booth, Indie Mega Booth, yeah. and also the sixth floor area, which is like the overflow for the Mega Booth. Uh, there is something like it's 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 wonderful. It's going to sound like such a like a. a high and mighty, I work in the Games Press thing, but we just came back from Gamescom, so like 80% of the stuff that's here at this show is stuff that we literally just spent an age looking at, and E3 so wasn't we've that got far ago either. That stuff is there. It's there, and like for people who are like coming to the show who don't get the opportunity to go to Cologne or go to LA for, for uh, Gamescom, like most of that stuff is known quantities, it's trailers and previews you've seen on game sites, so like it's cool to like get hands on with like Evolve maybe, the, the game that you kind of need to play, Yeah. but the Mega Booth is like, it's it's, 
you're wandering around and you don't know what you're going to run into. You might see some games like you had Galaxy on the floor. I saw that at PAX East. Like, uh -huh. that's there again. That's cool. Like, Cannonball was there. I played like 50 hours of that. But then M plus plus. you're like, what? yeah, like M plus plus was there. But then you run into stuff you never even heard of before. Sean was showing Bear Zerker earlier. Yeah. yeah. Did, you, did, really did cool. he talk about how he like really, like there was a little child he was playing with <laughs> and he did not like scale his ability at all. There's, like, he this, massacred a tiny there's, child. There's like this eight year old playing the game and he just swamped him. <laughs> no. no, he no didn't mention that. No, uh, he left it out. Weird. <laughs> the Meg Boot's great. And like everyone's just hanging around and like, yeah, like bumping into Teresa again. We're going to uh, get those guys back on the lobby in the next couple of weeks. Like bumping into Alexander Bruce, who made Anti Chamber and talking about games. And it's great. It's like, because so much of video games is the same stuff repeated over and over again. But in there, in there, you've got, yeah, and then you've got stupid, dumb nonsense. And then like there's this. Bra That's going to be a highlight. Yeah, Far Cry 4. <laughs> They're trying to. Can you and I do this later? In, in do you want to do that? You want to do that later? I, I that might be fun. I feel like we should. Get I don't know to if I want to get into the suit though that people have been being hella sweaty in for the past three days. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> a good point actually. <laughs> that's straight up. Elephants gross OP. If you want more uh, PAX show floor greatness, Danny, I think there's like a half hour tour of <laughs> yeah. you cruising around. We shot that thing and was like, we'll use it for the show. And then I was talking to Andy, and we'll break it up into like three sections or something. And I wander back in here, and he's like, I put it up. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? It's all up. It's like 32 minutes. It's, it's there. It's yeah. Good. So you want it's the extended good. tour? Danny's got you covered. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the highlight for me, aside from you know guests on this show, Behemoth's mm. Game 4 looks really yes. cool. Yes. Uh, was hosting the Civ Beyond Earth panel at, on Saturday. And, you know, Danny, you had the demo. You talked with those guys about yeah. Beyond Earth. That game is really cool. I'm really excited for it. I mm. got to play it a little bit. But if you folks want to see more about it, there's an extended demo and a lot of developer talk during that panel, which is posting Tuesday night on GameSpot. Awesome. So you can come back and check it out then. There's a little glimpse of Beyond Earth. Uh, would, I could just play that for, like, the rest of the week. I'm looking forward to watching that panel on the site because I don't have that much exposure to this series. But when I was talking to the guys on the stage yesterday, like... Some of the stuff, it's so outside of what regular civilization games are doing. Like what you were saying to me two days ago where history is a known quantity. Yeah. Like so much of stuff that can happen in this, like way more so than Alpha Centauri is just like crazy hypothetical future nonsense. And they're pulling from all kinds of sci-fi and making references, but also making stuff up themselves. Uh, mm. And isn't making stuff up what video games are all about. That's what video games are. It's stuff <laughs> that right. people made up. All right, uh, everybody here at Sector G, thank you so much for coming and Sector checking out our G. live show. You guys are awesome. It's been a pleasure to uh, to host y'all here. Uh, there'll be more food out later. I think there's some chicken tenders coming. I'm yes. going to go Cheers. eat them. Cheers. Uh, thank you all for watching online. We've got a ton more PAX coverage. Just check out the site to enjoy all that. We're off to do some more, and then we'll be back uh, on Tuesday for the live lobby. We'll have some PAX distilled and some more good stuff coming for you from GameSpot. I'm Chris Waters for Danny O'Dwyer, Mary Kish, all the GameSpot production team. Thank you so much <laughs> for watching our PAX coverage. It's been a blast. See you later. Video games.